This video is sponsored by Into the AM. I love Into the AM clothing. So much so, I decided to record this with two cameras. Not only do Into the AM sell awesome graphic tees, they also have an incredible basics range with awesome colors. And then to keep you warmer during those colder months, they now have jumpers, hoodies, and all those really, really warm bits of clothing too. The best bit is their Black Friday sale is now live with 30% off site-wide, and that's the minimum discount that you'll get. Certain things are up to 80% off. And I did lie when I said that that was the best bit. If you click the link down in the description, you'll get an additional 10% off as well. That's now some kind of huge number that you don't have to pay to get your hands on awesome clothes. Myself, Peachy and Jeff are all wearing our Into the AMTs in this episode. So if you're in the market to get some new clothes or if you're just looking to upgrade one or two pieces, click the link down in the description. The Black Friday sale is now on up to 80% off site-wide with an additional 10% if you click the link in the description. Crazy. Enjoy the show. Hello, I'm Peachy. Hello, I'm Patrick. Hello, I'm Jeff. And I'm going to preface this as I always do. If you want the opportunity to watch this early or get an opportunity to ask our guest questions, then consider joining our Patreon. I know, shameless blag time. We, we get called out on it, but it's fine. But <laughs> talking of which, we have a returning guest by popular demand, Mr. Tom Hibbard. Thank you for joining us Ooh. in our new digs. Nice, but this is amazing. I'm not sure your viewers will... How they haven't sat in the old studio, won't appreciate how much bigger this is. <laughs> so much bigger. <laughs> to the point where I was like, we've got so much space. Oh, you'll fill it. You'll still fill it full of stuff. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I oh, even yeah. purchased myself yeah. some office slippers office. the other day from Lidl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> They're so comfy. Yeah. Oh. So I, have, I don't often sort of think I say, no, but I've actually got slipper and I wish I'd got office slippers. Two pounds from Lidl. Oh. Two pounds. I mean, this is size eight to nine, so it's perfect I for me. I because they, they generally don't make slippers to fit me very often. We'll get some, you know, those kneeler boards. <laughs> You know, when you're like doing your garden, you get kneeler boards. We can get yeah. some of that and gaffer tape them. Right half comes back. <laughs> so, but yeah. Mike's slippers cost a fortune because they have to be they have to be towed down the Trent. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh dear, well, last dear. time we were on, yep. we got into loads of subjects, uh, which is really really good. Hobby trumpet, hobby trumpet. Oh. I mean, the, the episode did really well. I mean, you know, I, I think you you did a good service to, to workshop in general because you, you gave it a different light. Lots of people were like, oh, I never really thought about it like that. But there was a subject we didn't really cover, which okay. was fine cast. Ooh. And I know it's a contentious subject, it's mostly <laughs> for the staff that worked there at the time as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, you had different inner workings than what I did. Mine was a lot of face value kind of stuff that we're actually physically painting. Yeah. No one thought it was a good idea at the time. We were always like, why call it fine cast? None of it's fine. It's naff. It should be called naff cast. So <laughs> hard to sell that, I would say. <laughs> yeah. My limited business could knowledge. I, could I ask the the kind of like the noob question? You do, yeah. That's um, why you're here. Because I I think I have an understanding of what fine cast is, but um, I remember someone going, oh, I, I call this fail cast instead. Mm. So for those people that might be newer to the hobby, me, um, could you explain what fine cast is, was, does? Yes. And so to do so, I'm probably going to have to explain the whole project. Because I'm, it was a bigger project. I'm ready. Um, <laughs> so, and I'll I've strapped and, myself in. <laughs> and I'll explain my part in it first. Yeah. So I was, I was, I think it was going back to 2011. So this is 12 years ago. So my memory is going to be a bit hazy. Same. And I can only really speak for my part. So I was of a course, yeah. senior hobby designer. I worked in the hobby products department and I made the paints and the tools and everything else. I also had done, historically done quite a lot of like random packaging. And I was getting, and I got, or also some projects. I used to get seconded into random projects because I had a fairly flexible brain. Mm. I could, I'd, I did some of the work on the first eBooks and all sorts of stuff. But so they went, okay, we need, as part of the, a part of a wider project, we need a designer to come in and design the packaging and and help us with the industrial processes of switching over. Oh, okay. Okay. So, and before I came on the episode, I did a load of work, not a load of work, I just went and read some of the articles, just went and read as many articles as I could to try and remember. And yeah. most of those rumours online are largely true, mm. but you kind of need to put the threads together. So this was part of, so 
I can only speak for my part. The rest of it will be massive conjecture, and I'll attempt to yeah. explain when it is massive conjecture or not. Um, it's coming off the back of Lord of the Rings. Yeah. So that, that goes back even further. And during Lord of the Rings, the company expanded a lot because they're making loads of money. And yeah. There's loads of other issues, which we might touch on at some point. Like retail got, not lazy, but retail got quite... Um, they didn't have to work very hard for the money anymore. Yeah, yeah. Because people were just coming in and buying stuff. Yeah. We, could, we, we refer to it as called killing orcs as opposed to then dealing with the mummock, which was <laughs> what was left after that, after Lord of the Rings finished and ended. Uh-oh. You know the scene at Pelennor Fields? It's really easy killing orcs, isn't it? As a rider of Rohan, you're just treading over them. That was a customer base at that time. Oh, okay. This was the analogy. And then when all those customers went, it was mummock time. It was so hard well, to were, try and... Were those the big elephant things? Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. So that, that was yeah. the customer base after that. It was like really hard you know, to deal with. You know, one of them killed Alessio. Oh, yes, that <laughs> one. <laughs> Yes. Big elephant guys. <laughs> but it was a good analogy, and we used that in retail a yeah. lot. It was like, we've killed all the orcs, now we've got to fight the mummocks. This is hard. Yeah. Um, and and it had been many years of plenty where actually, you know, it was easy mm. to, to, to get the, the wheat off the fields, and the rain was bound to fall, and everything was wonderful. Yeah. And then suddenly things weren't like that anymore, and they had to fight, kill them, had to fight the mummocks, and getting money was much more difficult. Yeah. And um, because of those increased sales, the company had expanded new warehousing and it bought you know it bought a couple mm. of the buildings on the campus as they yeah. are now. So they basically yeah. paid for Eurohub 2 at the time and everything else which yeah. is if you've ever been it's the big warehouse right down the end of yes. the road and the, I think the building yeah. that we worked in yeah. that shakes every time a truck goes the past new build- yeah. 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 yeah 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 that one <laughs> yeah so a lot, so a lot you know he did a lot yeah, of I remember good. that not being there thing yeah, yeah. The um, but the problem is because everyone had got money really easily warehousing was too big manufacturing was too for the for the current sale there was a huge drop in sales yeah for the current volume of sales the infrastructure was just too big there was just too many people the factory was just too many machines there was too and it was a really difficult time really uh, mark wells talked about it on he was he was on a, a, a podcast and he was a ceo at the time is that oh, jordan yeah. sorceries might well have been yeah, yeah. yeah um really interesting interview it's a bit interesting what he what he didn't say hmm. it was kind of more interesting than what he did say but i know mark i know yeah. mark's so i won't yeah but, yeah, but he talked about it then, and it was very difficult because it was a bloated company and it needed trimming, and that's yeah. not pleasant for, no. any, for anybody. Yeah. Um, the reason I talk about this is one of the places they wanted to do some trimming was in miniatures production. So that time there were spun cast. The, if people don't, uh, don't know how, how familiar your viewers are casting. with manufacturing, metal spin yeah. cast, you actually get a rubber mould, to simplify things, yeah. with some cavities in it. And you get molten metal. They call it magic pixie dust. I think it's just pewter, but, you know, whatever. And that gets, that gets melted and poured in. And then because it's being spun under centrifugal force, uh, yeah. all the metal gets pushed out into these cavities, right? So yeah. that's how they're making miniatures. But it's quite a, it's quite a, it is quite a time-consuming mm. bit of time uh, process. And there was a lot of people. So there was a lot of people in spin casting. There was a lot of people in blister packing. There was a lot of people in all of this sort of stuff. And they really wanted to make cost efficiencies. Cost efficiency means... Uh, losing people's jobs. It's, it's a nice way of putting it. It's a nice it. way of putting it. It's not a nice thing. But they really wanted to make cost efficiency, right? And <laughs> you heard Chris has heard this one has heard this one before, right? Uh, but this was happening across the whole business. Yeah. And it was quite a scary time because yeah. you didn't no one really knew if they had their job. Yeah. Because you never knew where the eye of Sauron was going to cast its eye next. <laughs> We're really hitting hard with those Lord of the Rings now, aren't we? <laughs> um, you're like, okay, so who's, like, and, he, and uh, you, you saw departments getting like gutted more than gu- getting gutted yeah. all the time, and you're like, this is really quite a scary place. Yeah, I mean, I was in retail at the time. You thought retail would be quite safe because you need those bodies to, yeah. to get the people in. It, retail wasn't safe. I mean, we had seven staff at the Derby store. We had to trim that down to three. Holy um, crap. Yeah, so four, sorry, because we were allowed a key timer. Um, so was yep. a manager, two full timers, and you were allowed one, which became a part timer. So I had to trim that. That, that, was, that was horrible. And you, it literally was like, how long have you been working here? This long. Sorry, guys. He's been here longer. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, do you have any disciplinaries? No, sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a weird matrix of like length of service, dis- disciplinary yep. record. So you just had to trim it that way. It was, it was fair. But not fair, if that makes sense. Never, yeah. Losing yeah. job is never, yeah, no, never, never a nice thing, yeah. no matter, no matter yeah. how you want to do it. Um, so they're going through manufacturing, and they were looking at, hold a manufacturing process, where can we, where can we trim? Yeah. And they, there were always some seasonal staff that bring in before Christmas. Actually, they come in, they, they don't come in at Christmas, they come in like January to build mm. the next Christmas stock. But So you can lay some seasonal staff off because they're seasonal. Sorry, can I just say, Games Workshop preparing 
in January for the next Christmas. Something like that, yeah. That's unheard of. <laughs> of well, from marketing, anyway. <laughs> um, so, so, one of the, one of the, so we're just going around the, around the factory looking at where you can make savings. And one of the ones was blister packing. So people may, may not even remember the old blisters, which was a little bit of plastic, clear plastic, and a backing yeah. card. Yeah. And you put the... And then they picked the, the metal miniatures at the time, and there might be four, five, six, seven different little bit little pieces. Yeah. And they all got picked out of a tray, put into these things. Yeah. And they had a whole load in front of them. Because that's that's still how they do. Cause yes. We, uh, me and Peach were at the like the Warlord Open Day, and that's we we got to see the spin casting, and then you still get the blisters with the bits in, and it yep. says this has been packed by. And the human name, and they put a little yeah. tag in. That's nice. Yeah. Um, but it's, just, it's that system, yeah. maybe slightly. Actually, probably not even that large. Those, those machines probably went. They probably some of those machines are probably from yeah. workshop. Yeah. Um, and there were a number of issues. So was not, there was a number of problems with that. One of the ones. One of the ones we were. So one of the part of the project was to look at this whole process. Mm. How many people can we get rid of? Cost efficiency. Great. Mm. Um, what new? What new? New tech sounds a bit poncy, but what? What new packaging technologies can we bring in to make to make this this yeah. process more efficient, less people in it? Okay, fine. And that then suddenly brought in a load of a load of stuff. So one of them was changing the blister card and the blister backing because they were both in terms of because re recycling was starting to be a a bigger mm. thing. And if you're a large company, you have to pay I forget what the name of it, but you have to pay a tax on every bit of non non usable packaging that goes out. So Games Workshop have to pay some money to the government for every bit of cardboard that goes out. Oh, right? wow. It's why the the packaging inside paint sets is maybe a bit over-specced, because then it's a pallet, uh, and it's not an internal bit of packaging. Uh, okay. That's why it's got little wells in it and brush holders. Secrets. and Right? Um, but also then, it's a, if you attach your first paint set, you've suddenly got, a, you don't need a pallet, you've got yeah. a pallet, and you've yeah. got somewhere to store your things, and it's a much more usable product, and that makes sense. So the same sort of process was going into blister packing. With a with a front blister pack and a back blister pack and glue, both of those are contaminated and you can't recycle them. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so that has to go. So what's the different different system? Um, <coughs> that was that was one aspect. One aspect was all these multiple picks. So when they've got a load of metal bits, uh, you know, you you've got one man and a head and a backpack and a and a left arm with the plasma pistol and a power fist on the other arm. So they're um, all being separate limb bins. They're as well, all being little they? limb bins. Yeah, all lined up. Okay. And they'd have to do all these little separate picks to pick them into a... And then you get missed picks yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, there's normally... They do a weight check, so they weigh, they weigh stuff to make sure that... There's, hopefully. Yeah. To make sure there's as little problems as possible. But, yeah, so that every single of those was a pick. And, and you pay for a pick because you're paying for a human... Yeah. To put all the stuff in the limb bin in the first... You've got to cast it. You've got to make the mould to cast it to put it in the lin bin, to move it to another area, to take it out again, to put it into a blister packing system, to then put it into a machine to take it out. It's so every, a lot of steps. It's a lot of, lot of so it's how, how can we get rid of operations? Yeah. And also even just the simple things like, you know, putting the card in and doing this and having a machine. And so we went to the current system, which is, um, I'm not sure they use it anymore, but the kind of the clear pack. Yeah. And we made sure, and I, we made sure we had a tear off strip so we didn't get people slicing themselves with, because that's when everything was clamshelled and people were, yeah, cut, were cutting yeah. themselves on the clamshells and you had to use big scissors. So there's a tear-off strip on the back of those to make sure that which I had to fight quite a lot for. And also, blister packs are really boring, right? Yeah. They're like, yeah. The, old, the old school ones are really boring. You couldn't really see what the model was. Especially with the sponge as well. Sometimes yeah, with the sponge. Like, yeah. And you just had a little... Oh, we did look at taking the sponge out. That's, that was Because that's cost. That's yeah, like yeah. 1p. Yeah. But if you take 1p out of every blister pack, you can save money. Yeah. yeah. Um. But the only and you just had a little sticker and and do you remember the little letters because yeah. they had a, the letter because yeah, 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 that was yeah, universal for yeah, different yeah. countries. Everything was lifted. The letter gave you the yeah. indication of the price. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and you, you had a chart like on a the G, wall. Because all you that. do in France is you get rid of the the pounds and you put up the yeah. you know yeah, yeah. what the euros uh, wherever yeah. you are wherever in the world you just change those card <laughs> strips. Like, this right, is okay. mental. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like um, my reaction to the last chat show was how it was received by the audience because I just stood there and went, "Wow." <laughs> for like two hours um, and it was an amazing experience yeah so right so that was that yeah so we went to we one of the things we one of the things i can't remember who had the idea it might be me might be someone else we effectively went let's just turn the blister around and let's and let's put in a little bit of paper on the front which has a nice nice shiny picture yeah yeah because then it's a paint guide and it's vastly more attractive and when it's in a, a store it actually looks nice rather than 
a whole load of grey things with some grey things inside, actually. So we did that. Um, so, yeah. so that was one of the things we did. Um, the next project was to reduce the number of picks. And a lot of these things were happening separately. So we were working on this, and another team was working on this, and, th- and the different things were going on. So the next one, they, were taking, they, were, they, were, they wanted to sprue up the individual metal components into one pick. So rather than being four separate pieces which had to be extracted from the mould, put into lin bins, blah, 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 as we've been about, they'd they'd be on a little fake metal sprue inside the mould, just like they they currently are. Yeah, yeah. Um, But that meant it's just one operation to pick it up, put it Mm. in a bin, and one operation to put it into a pack. Yeah. To save a lot of time. So some clever people went off and laid them all out and worked out what size it was and all that sort of stuff. I mean, it had to be in the same size as the old blister, overall size as the old blister pack, but they worked out how big the cavity was and... You know, some clever people. Because wasn't they like um, some of them were like long strips, but they had like a slight indentation, so you just snap, so you end up with like <coughs> two. Yes, you fold up, fold over, and there was a couple of depths because yeah. some of the some of them. So that went on, and that but that kind of made sense because then you need people lose their jobs because there's less operations needed to pick mm. the things. Um, there was also less and less of those miniatures being sold in the first place because the plastification was going on. Mm. You know, originally Games Workshop was all spun cast metal miniatures yeah, on a yeah. wall and a couple of plastic kits and as we all know there's more and more plastic kits and that's got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and it was definitely a willingness to stop making metal miniatures just make plastic stuff yeah. mm. right because it's it, for most people it's a better material to work with yeah. and metal's difficult yeah. and you need to pin pinning wasn't metal getting more costly as well at that point yeah, yeah. Um, so we'd done so the packaging great okay also that packaging meant we needed Less time, so the cycle time was less because it was just sonically welded, done in. You didn't need to glue things and turn it around. The packing was faster because it was sprued. Mm. Then what happened is, as part of this, is that pewter prices went up. I don't know if it's pewter or not, but yeah. we'll call it pewter. Pewter prices went up massively. Like there was just a suddenly a tin shortage or something across the world. Yeah. So they were like, okay, so we're going to have to put the prices up. When we talked about group margin last time um, and how it affects everything. And it's yeah. a real pain. Yeah. It's a real pain as a designer. It's a pain for everybody. And we looked at, other than for the shareholders, who obviously, yeah, great, make loads of money. Um, so the group, the price of the product was going to have to sky. It was a lot. Mm. It was like, I'm going to, don't quote this, all the internet news sites, yeah. <laughs> 50%. Totally made that number up. Yeah. But something like that. Yeah, like, I heard it. Speculation. It speculation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know what you guys do. Um, so it's going to be, it's going to give it, so... And it was like, the customer is just not going to bear this because they, Games Workshop was not going to hold its, not going to reduce price. It was not going to drop its group margin. It was not going to do any of that. Yeah. And also because the volume of metal was getting smaller, I think that was part of the problem. They were mm. buying less, so you can get a less, you get a, you get a worse deal. Mm. Um, so they were looking at, okay, so let's switch. So then another team was looking at, okay, we need to switch to a different material. Yeah. And Forge World and other departments were using resin. Yeah. It's how we got the miniatures painted before they were all like you know yeah. made in plastic because the plastic process took so long mm. that you'd have to have resin casts of them, which was a nice resin. Um, yeah, because it was done in very slow, low quantities. Yeah, yeah. By a, someone that was very good at it and could spur it up very carefully. So when we heard about this, we all got very excited because we <laughs> were like, "Oh, this resin I paint for like you know the box packaging stuff is very sexy. It's very nice." And resin, resin can hold can hold better detail than metal oh. so you're like okay yeah. in theory this is a great idea because the miniatures are going to look great mm. um there's a generational thing like the stuff you guys are handling so when i say generation when you make a miniature certainly in a, in a kind of in a molding in a traditional molding technique rather than cutting steel if you're making a pewter or a resin miniature there's generations of mold so you have your master mm your master miniature could be something that they're physically sculpted. Yeah. Then that goes into a master mould and they take tins out. Tins are like the first generation casts. I think you've had some guests on that have talked about how things squish and they move. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so you need to make yeah. it a bit fat because it's going to get 3% shorter this yes. way and all yeah. sorts of stuff like that. So the tins are better quality and the tins would then be what heavy metal would and you guys would get yeah. originally. And the kind of the same goes for resin as well. So you'd get the first generation moulds. Then there'd be... And those things, they're then very precious. These are because that's mm. what you make the moulds out of. Then there's another generation, and then those are the ones that you make the moulds from. So by the time the customer gets it, you're on like a third or a fourth generation pressing. Yeah. And every time you lose detail, and every time you lose a bit of geometry, things go a bit 
squishy or weird yeah. or potentially, you know... Well, the, the mould slips as well yeah, sometimes. Yeah, you get, so you get, you get flash lines and all sorts yeah. of stuff. But yeah, the, the talk was, let's go to a resin. So the, um, but what they didn't want to do is spend a load of money on new capital machinery. And also, resin's quite a slow, traditional process. You guys have seen it, probably seen a bit of it. Yeah. You're very intimate with it. <coughs> Very intimate. In intimate. Intimate with resin. That's a whole other <laughs> podcast, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's Peachy, Patreon only. <laughs> yeah. So there's a whole thing. So We're going to be selling them casts eventually. <laughs> yeah. Moulding bits of Peachy for money. Yeah. Ah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a kit you assemble. You know, it's like a, a part work. Yeah. You slowly assemble a full one-to-one scale Peachy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Eventually, though, the problem being is, is if you buy them part works, it's more expensive than just buying a Peachy from scratch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. All right. <laughs> so they didn't want to spend a load of money on new machinery. And actually, there isn't really a lot of machinery in resin production other than some vacuum to get the bubbles out. And yeah. So it's a very manual process, yes. traditionally. Yeah. So they're like, OK, so how do we make this faster? And the, fir- and the first thought, we're just going to use, well, they just wanted to use the rotational spin machines. Let's, let's find a resin. Let's work with our mm. resin manufacturer to find a resin that goes off in about the right sort of time that you mix in the right quantities. You can put it into a rotational spin cast machine, just like we traditionally use, yeah. pretty much using the same moulding techniques. So it's the same, not necessarily the same moulds because we need to alter them a bit, but the same same process. Um, and this was all done. And, yeah, <laughs> and the promise never really lived up to the reality. Um, and there was loads of issues with the first stuff. So it was... Um, bubbles in it lots of flashing because mm-hmm. the moulds wouldn't close properly um bits everywhere you get major bubbles where things just wouldn't cast because chins nose. chins and noses and yeah. tips of swords and stuff yeah um and it i remember i remember it very well because one we got the first ones and we're looking at it and that's where the resin cleanup kits came from so we're like this is from our perspective fine maybe this is Probably not cool for an experienced user, but at least they're an experienced user. Mm. For a 14-year-old, yeah. and we go back to that wider end of the hobby trumpet thing we talked about last time, for a 14-year-old yeah. with limited skills and heuristics and ability to use tools, <clears throat> this is going to be really difficult. And it's a lot softer than white metal. Yeah. Mm. So things like knives are just going to carve straight through it. And I don't know what the, was the composition of the resin, but it was really it was softer than the it stuff was Forge, soft, yeah. Forge World used. So it was very easy to just even just with a traditional file or a knife or a set of cutters just to carve straight through it. I've lost so many bits of a, a blade or a model where I've just been like trying to like find because you've got the mold line on there and a chunky mold line in places where sometimes you can just run the edge of the blade or the file and gets yeah. rid of it. Other times you have to dig in, dig in too much. <laughs> You've lost like a whole chunk of your arm and it just and it ain't yeah. going back on. So that's where the original mold line scraper came from. It was part of that project because we couldn't, because the cleanup was significantly more than, because of the flashing and you know, the way it was, the cleanup was significantly more than a traditional metal model. Yeah. Where you'd kind of just a bit of, t- mm. take some of the vents off where the, where the air comes out. Yeah. Bit of a bit of a file done. The cleanup was significantly more, but if they used the traditional tools, they'd have just ripped the thing apart. So we made the mold line scraping tool because we had to sell a, something to a 14 year old and you can't sell them a knife yeah. Yeah. in most, most places on the, that we sell into you can't you can't sell an 18 roller sharp pointy thing so we sold them the thing and then they also need they're just covered in bits of flash that's where the little brush comes from yeah which I still yeah. use yeah, yeah. <laughs> to take and that just you ran that over and that just took all the bits of most of the bits of flash off yeah. without having to get in there with a knife or was that or like a, a wire brush looks like a toothbrush or? pretty oh, much right. yeah, yeah. nylon bristles we basically went and bought went to like the range yeah popular home store in the UK yeah. <laughs> um, and bought or every single type of bristle we possibly could yeah. and then just scrubbed them and went oh this one works yeah. and then measured it and went okay it's 0.5 mil nylon bristles about this long did a quick design and then they made it for us um, brilliant liquid green stuff yeah to fill, fill in, in all those holes to fill in all the holes <laughs> <laughs> the little the little emery boards because we used because the file was too was, the file we sold was too aggressive. I forgot about the emery boards. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah I because, about because them. the file we sold was too aggressive for resin. So we did little emery yeah. boards, little shaped emery boards, um, loads of little bits to try and and it's like but and it kind of tells you that this wasn't a great. So the feeling in the studio was not good because mm. we should not be having to make all of these things to deal with yeah. a product. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember um, we got a few models through, and there was like a lot of saw tips, spear tips broken, and like the other metal painters. And this is where I learned this for like when I've broken saw tips and spear tips in the past. Is you you drop some super glue on it, where you turn the model upside down, so it's like gravity's pulling it down. You get like a bit of a bubble of super glue at the edge of your blade. Mm. 
we've got accelerant, so we, we spray it, it hardens, and then you can just file that to a point. So instead of sitting there for ages using like liquid green stuff, waiting for that to dry, you literally get like some super glue, you file it down, you get a nice point, and sometimes you have to build it up. And we're there like going, why are we spending hours re-sculpting a model when it should just come as it is? Especially the bit, and this, and I don't know how this came about, are the weird Vs in every... So wherever there was like a like a join or something, you get like a little resin like V. Oh, yeah. Uh, you get, like you get them on Forge World still. Yeah, so you yeah. get them like yeah. under the nose, you get them under the chin. So it's you have to off. literally yeah. re-sculpt a model. Yeah. Um, and it's, yeah, it was... It, what I uh, my impression of Finecast at the time was like we're going to get the stuff that we painted. Yeah, and that's um, what most people thought. We're going to yeah. get we're going to get lovely, beautiful, and the customers are going to love it because it's, it's quality. It's really crisp quality, good mm. stuff. And then what we got didn't bear much relation. I can understand why. Um, so they were trying to spin cast it, and then there was and then they had to put loads of little vents and stuff in to try and get it to flow properly through a yeah. spin cast. Because traditionally with resin, to do resin really well, it takes a long time and it needs to go into a vacuum chamber. And then the vacuum chamber takes all the all the bubbles takes out. The bubbles out. Yeah. Um, and it takes time to cure. Whereas this had to cure a lot faster. And it didn't really have the time for it to vent. And and it wasn't in a vacuum? No. 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 It was, I don't know what they're doing now. Yeah. I, don't, well, I, don't, I mean, there's still fine yeah. cast models out there. Yeah. Um. Um, and, they were, and, and they were on one sprue. So you can see how the whole kind of thing came together. Mm. So they were sprued up tick done that yeah. less people in the packaging process less people in the casting process because you need less people to do stuff because it's on a sprue yeah. packaging is different the whole way we the whole way the the blisters were manufactured was different so cost efficiencies da, 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 da. um i remember there was a load of qc issues because they, they, they were coming up to the original sculptor for to check in to go back down again on a kind of pass fail system and everything was failing because it was just not good enough yeah I think eventually they, I don't know, stopped sending stuff up. No, we had to lower our standards. Had to lower, we had to lower, yeah, there we go. We had to lower the QA standards. <laughs> we had to lower the expectations because it was a different type of resin. So, oh, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, which is not, no. which is not great. No. And then, and then, went, and then what, all of this is, was a pain and I could kind of understand it because it was a lot, because at this point it was all about cost efficiency and cost saving and keeping the cost down for the consumer. I was like, okay. Yeah it's not great but okay well maybe we can live with this and then marketing got hold of it and the biggest issue for me with Finecast was the message that went out to consumers mm. because the message that went out to consumers was this is better mm. it's better quality more detail it's better for you and it just it just wasn't true no it just wasn't true all of those things were true it was just it was patently obviously not true yeah right um, and I think a lot of the feedback I haven't read a lot of comments on the last video I was in, was that Games Workshop just need to be more honest sometimes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think had they been more honest back then, people would have been more, much more... I think people would have still been cross. Yeah. Right? But they would have been, they would have been Because it's... But they would have been a lot less cross if they'd actually understood what was going on mm -hmm. and why it was happening. But I remember being in... The Moot, which was the big meeting room. Yeah. If you've been to games, if you've been to Lenten, we, our big, office used to be there. So, uh, was yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So it's a big octagonal tower at the as you go in. Yes. Was the bottom floor? That's the Moot, the big meeting room. Yeah. Um, so where you used to hit Dave Andrews with swords. It was, yeah, quite regularly. Or he hit me, to be fair. So occasionally, <laughs> you'd, you'd, you'd go to the gym at lunch, and then you walk down, you walk down to the change room, and you'd hear a lot of banging and crashing and you walk into the moot and then Dave Andrews and Feature were in armour smacking each other do, doing some reenactment training <laughs> still need to learn how to disarm that guy because he could take my sword off me I and it'll fling in aim for the shoulder <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would like because I'd start off right handed so I, I learned to like fight right handed uh, he didn't realise at the time because he used to sit quite opposite far away he forgot I was left handed so every now and again I'd just swap and like uh -huh. it'd be like the uh, Princess Bride thing yeah. I am left handed I am too left handed so it would like freak him out a bit because it was the same size but he always used to be able to like just flick my sword out of my hands and I remember saying that when how, how, can you show me how to do that I was like when you've had 25 years of like real acting experience I'll show you I was like Dave so I was a no then <laughs> if you're watching Dave one day one day um, so we're in the moot I'm having a studio meet and mm. marketing did a presentation to the studio on how great fine cost was and this was the message that was going to go out to the kind of internal comms message because marketing was much more internal communications at that point. It yeah, was, it was it not so customer-facing as it yeah. is now. Oh, okay. Very, yeah, I've worked in marketing at, at, yeah. at Games Workshop, and it's, it was very much, when I was there, it was the kind of more range management um, and internal communications mm -hmm. and events. It wasn't like the outward-facing. It's before Games Workshop got a grip on things a bit more and started being a lot more outward-facing than, mm. than they were. Um, 
and they told us all this stuff about it's great for the consumer and it's really easy to work with and it holds really good detail and we're like it's just not true and the designers are like the miniature designers are just like hands up <laughs> um, asking these questions and it all we got back was like the parroted line yeah and it's like guys come on you're amongst, you're amongst friends now let's not yeah if you can't be honest with us in this in this yeah. room at this point and they just kept repeating that marketing message and we're like this is not going to go well and it didn't yeah do you know the bit I think that would disgust me the most is the fact if I'd then bought a thing I'd had to take home yeah. re-sculpt yeah. buy extra tools to work my way around it and then at the very core of it and this is old militant me at work here but at the very core of it know that that thing I've got I've got it because it costs someone a job mm. that would really irk me I'm yeah. glad that was in the gap that I wasn't in the hobby because I think I'm having to put all this work in and spend more money and the, and somebody's got has now lost a job for me to do yeah. this. I think that would be really, really sour, I think. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad I only know now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the it, it wasn't done out of badness. This is, this is the thing that gets me a lot of the time. A lot of people think Games Workshop's a really evil empire. And it's not. A lot of it's just done for really sensible reasons, but they're sometimes they're really badly communicated. Or people don't fess up when things aren't working as it, well as they should be. And it's be. kind of. I find I get I get really I get still get a bit frustrated about that about things like this. Yeah. Yes, people make a mistake or they don't. Something's not working, but just be honest about it. Yeah. And let's be honest with our consumers. They're not idiots. Yeah. They know they they're generally very bright. They know what. Just be honest and look. We need to change material because our current process costs us too much yeah. money. Can you bear with us? Our intention is to go plastic. Yeah which is what they've done. Yeah. yeah. That that's that was always the intention. It took longer than they wanted. The intention was only like a couple of years. Yeah. Um to reduce the number of and then switch everything over to hero blisters, which is another project I worked on. Um because I'd already done that one so I was just doing the blisters. Was that just the the marines where you just push them out? No, it was the, it was just the, 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 the just the way the the heroes are now. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah I was involved yeah, yeah. in that project yeah. as well. That was that's what was, that was actually the design intention. Mm. <clears throat> they were here with the traditional metal miniatures and blisters. What we wanted was this. What Games Workshop wanted was this yeah. bit here. These hero blisters that we all know now. Yeah. Um, and this was a difficult transition phase. Yeah. And I think, and it just was very troubled. And, and the intention was always... It did do. It made the plastic sprues look much more mega. <laughs> 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 uh, so it kind of goes, to me it always goes, yeah, this goes back to that, talking about intention, being yeah. honest with the consumers. Yeah. And I think... Yes, it was not Games Workshop's finest hour. I mean, was, I'm, I'm looking back now, and I, I think at home in my collections, I've probably got less than ten fine cast figures um, because I didn't want them. Because you you would, and when we were doing it for work, when we this is a ridiculous thing. So we we're doing like projects, and it were like, right, we're going to do some striking scorpions. Let's order a set. No, let's order ten sets because across those ten sets, you're going to get five good figures. Because what you do is you get a set, and there's five separate poses two of them will be fine but the other three will be naff so you have yeah. to go through the next boxes knowing there's probably going to be batches that are same here so those three have not cast very well so that means chances are the same three are not going to be cast well in multiple boxes were you in retail and fine casting no i was in studio they must have been a real thing in retail of standing there and watching people come oh in yeah that too and i'm working their way and not that one so not my, that my, one, that my one. mate would go to one world and he'd be like, uh, I want some, let's say, what are the Blood, blood Knights? He wanted yeah. a box of Blood Knights, 55 quid for a box of five resin, 55 quid for resin as well. That time was like mad because the metals were like 45 and they just ranked up in price for like um, the resin versions. And he'd open a box and he'd be like, that one's good. These ones aren't good enough. So they'd yeah. open another box and there's only like three on the shelves. So yeah. he was like, I'm not paying for this. I want, so then I'd have to order some more in. So then he, over the like the course of like the next week or so, he could get five good, decent casts from his set. And that's what the rule it's was. If you, if you bought a box and, you, and they weren't good catch, you took them back and you got them replaced. Oh, right. So uh, then would, say like whoever that was did that, would all the bad ones go back into boxes? No, and then don't. someone that thought... N Oh, I'm going to buy these, and it's actually the five terrible ones I mean, that a member of staff put back. In theory, no. I wouldn't be able to... I don't know. No. In yeah. theory, no. You, but because yeah. they were never shrink wrapped because they were the white boxes, oh, a lot yeah, of them were, yeah. that had, like, Citadel 40k Warhammer on it. Some... I'm not going to... I'm not, this is speculation, but some stores are more interested in profit than, like, doing the right thing, because we have experienced that by working with some of those. They might have put them back in, but the right thing to do was send them back or just... Um, no one lost them. No, the returns whatever. rate was enormous. Yeah. Like, huge returns rate. Um, it just makes it really sad because 
it was, it was a good concept. It was a, the concept yeah. was there. It was done for the right reasons, and the wrong thing came out at the other end of it. I think that kind of and that happens for a lot of businesses. It happens. I've seen it happen. You've seen it happen a lot at Games Workshop. You know, the, the project the project is there for the right reasons, but you get the wrong outcome. Yeah, or and the outcome get, isn't as good as you would have wanted it. But you hit the nail on the head. It's like being honest about it and like yeah. fessing up those mistakes makes you look more human, makes you look more uh, accessible and approachable. I mean, like again, you know, not learning from these things. Curse City was a prime example of that. You know, we were on live at the time and we were having to lie to people. To well, in fact, I didn't lie. I just didn't answer the questions yeah. um, because it was someone and. An, you know, I'm not saying who because I don't know who, but someone definitely screwed up a message, didn't pass that down, and then everyone else had to deal with the fallout of that as opposed to going, oh, I really screwed up here, guys. Um, and then just going, oh, you know what? We didn't order enough and we thought this and you know what? We're making some more. It's made to order now. Put your orders in because yep. that's fine. That's, you know, made to order does take a while, 180 days, but... I mean, it's doubly frustrating because the company culture, if you look at the outwardly facing company culture and they talk to staff about it's about being honest it's, it's about one being, of your muses and graces it's about being open and honest and honesty humility integrity yeah and we're your three main ma- so <laughs> we had the black book the tom kirby black book um Madness. and as staff you had to adhere to the black book religiously you had to be honest humble have integrity, always fess up when you've made a mistake, be courageous. And if you see a manager make mistakes, tell them. As soon as you did that, they bring the back book going, it's a guideline. It's just a guideline. But then when you're being told off, it wasn't yeah, a guideline, yeah, it was a it set was, of rules. And when you're in an appraisal, it absolutely wasn't because there were subject headings in your appraisal, which yeah. were, the, were the music. Give us an example of when you have displayed yeah. this in the, in the past year. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, hang on, but so is it, so it's, a, it's an absolute or it's a guideline? Depending on who's in... Or it's this, or you're, you've not been exhibiting these behaviours at all. So why am I exhibiting these? Anyway, that's a whole different rant. We can yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. But, but, <laughs> I've got many, many hours of like, but hang it, on a minute. But it's, it's, it, goes, it kind of goes hand in hand with this decision-making stuff. Someone at some point should have been courageous enough to put their hand up, yeah. go to senior management and go on. This is not working. Yeah. This is just not going to work. Yeah. Or if it is, it's going to cost us a load of issue. And they may well have done. And see, I don't know. Senior management may well have gone, OK, we're just going to take it. Because for us, it's we're, we're here. We want to be here. This is the only way we're going to get from here to here. Mm. It may just we're just going to have to ride out. I don't know. Yeah, that could well have been a someone may well have been courageous yeah, enough to absolutely, go. Absolutely, this yeah. is the situation. This, yeah. this is where we are, and this I, is how we're going to get here. I mm. haven't seen any for a while. What's fine cast? Fine cast state is it? In it's there? no different. I don't really. think they even they, talk. They don't really call it fine cast anymore, do they? Or is it? Uh, they say resin miniatures usually okay. in the. Uh, I think it still has. It, no, it might not even have the same heading because they used to have like the little I know fine cast not much symbol of it left. Is the I think. The thing that bothered me the most with it... Well, three um, or four Marines, I think, left in front of us. The problem is not the Eldar range, which is what I do. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of little yeah. characters. Like Lord of the Rings, a fair few of those are still, um, because they don't do metal anymore. Yeah. So anything. So my biggest bugbear was, I remember the Perry's working on, um, they did a box set of plastic uh, wood elves, Mirkwood wood elves, but they were the palace guard, and you rarely see them, because they just guard Thranduil and his whores. They don't turn up to any of the battles. They get stabbed a couple of times by some orcs when they're all in the barrels trying to get away. <laughs> Um, and the Perrys had done plastics of those and they started doing plastics of the Mirkwood Elves which were like swordsmen and archers Mm -hmm. and it was like no I haven't got time on the schedule Uh, we're just going to make those into fine cast so the things that you needed most of were super expensive and really hard to clean up the things you didn't need any of were like plastic Plastic. and it was like it was maddening so I started doing a a Mirkwood Elf army and I was just like you know what I'm just going to get a load of the Palace Guard and count them as Mirkwood Elves because I do not care Um, because I'm not spending like 120 quid on 12 figures um i'm not doing that i'm going to spend 25 quid on 24 figures do you know what i think was well must have worked quite well on their favor for a little while was that when the fine cast thing was starting to take off um the same point in time mantic had sort of launched and when mantic launched kings of war initially before it had a, a rule set it was a really it was a way of collecting a Warhammer fantasy army without yeah. collecting Warhammer fantasy army and their prices were quite rock bottom and yeah. especially and they were still working in quite reasonable materials as well and you think that must have dented them for a little while not only have you dropped the ball but somebody else has done a pretty good job of picking it up well they were quite lucky not in too rude to Mantic but the first releases were pretty yeah. It's aesthetically pretty awful yeah, yeah. But, but you've got to start from somewhere right? But you've got to start yeah. somewhere and also Ronnie, 
I know Ronnie from years back. Ronnie's thing was always lots of men for not much money. Yeah, that was always their thing. Yeah. So you're like, so you kind of went, you just kind of went with it. You're like, yeah. that's kind of. But I mean, uh, take the Perrys. I mean, they were like knocking out the historical, like Napoleonic stuff, and you get like forty two figures for fifteen pounds. I mean, it's gone up to twenty now, and that's. In 10 years, it's gone up five pounds. Yeah. That's not bad. But um, the quality of those, and, uh, you know, even now I still don't understand how they managed to, like, make them so cheap and put so much in there and then get... Um, oh, who's the artist? Uh, Peter Dennis uh, doing all the art for all the uh, the front covers for all the boxes. Well, they use very old tech. Yeah, yeah, that's still, true. They still yeah. use three-ups, yeah, squeezes, three pantographs. Yeah. yeah. They use very, very old tech. Um, and that's how they do it. Yeah. Um, it's... They're not using... Digital. Digital... 3D sculpting, uh, high end. They, they, they use a lathe, but they're not using the high end stuff that works. So I keep using. getting big boxes with lots of toy soldiers, and it's old tech. I'm happy with that. Yeah, well, same with what's name who's that other bunch who, who've been doing stuff that sort of tiptoes on the edge of 40k. Is it uh, is it War Games Atlantic? Yes, yeah, the Grognards. <laughs> yeah, and you open that, and it's like a, the, something like it's like 20 men in a box and something like 108 eight heads. Or yeah, yeah, because yeah. you, know, yeah, you give them like because there's, there's a set of like French that are like First World War. Yeah, but yeah. you give them First World War helmets. Yeah, or with gas masks. That's right. Yeah. Um, or you give them like I, I guess old guard style big bear skins. Yeah. So they look a bit more sort of sci-fi yeah. and then you can do like gas masks there's so many look like Vestroyans yeah, yeah yeah pretty much Vestroyans yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, you got, yeah. so you get so many like choices well, I'm not, I'm not going to defend Games Workshop's pricing people seem to think I was on the last one I'm really not no, no, so, no. you know but they Games Workshop will well, charge what they think they can get away with yeah. but that's sometimes that's not cool and sometimes it's, it's I mean it's fine you know? I used to say this a lot to like colleagues and a lot of colleagues would have would still agree now and agreed at the time when you go to the shop uh, at your lunchtime like oh I'm going to go and buy a box of such and such because um, it's out and you get to the you get to the, the shelf and you see you're like at half price that still seems quite a lot <laughs> you know what I'll yeah. skip um, so yeah when you when you're when you've got a 50% discount and you're still like scratching your head thinking do I do buy I really this, this? Yeah, yeah that 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 is a warning sign that things are a bit too much and I know I've heard this party line so many times like you got to think of like all the effort that's put in putting to there's the tooling there's the artistry there's the sculpting I was like yeah I get that but when two box sets have the same amount of artwork graphic design weight in plastic and same amount of bits and one's 90 quid and one's 30 quid you've got to ask your questions why that is oh it's because it's better in the game i don't give a damn if i'm play painting them i don't care if it's better in the game yeah, if yeah. it's the, if in general it's all had the same well then you are then you are then you are having to admit to um pay to win culture aren't yeah you? yeah you know which is which i do think is the case in some places yeah you know, you know think, depending on what you're buying yeah yeah you know and, and you know and pay to win goes through video games yeah. and collectible card games and everything else but it's not a very nice culture to have I mean currently Raid Shadow Legends one of our favourite sponsors of, of the channel as well is like Into the Aim as we're currently uh, wearing at the moment uh, there's a uh, currently this month they've got Xena Warrior Princess as a character the All only right. way you can get her is if you upgrade to gold uh, gold access which is like 50 quid a month and I was like oh because I, I, I was like looking at all the challenges you get and you can't get her you can get like a, an avatar of her but you can't actually get her she is available um as one of the the characters so you've just got to risk getting one of these uh, legendary crystals to hopefully get her but to definitely get her you have to pay 50 quid and i was like i'll just see if xena turns up if i'm really lucky but it's xena man i want lucy lawless in my warband i mean you could <laughs> for the cheap cheap price of 50 pounds yeah no that's a bit like yeah pay to win's not good yeah yeah i mean i don't mind it if it's like uh, just a bit of fun here and there like 20p but when it's like yeah, that kind of money you're like nah I'm good well I've played a lot of World of Tanks and World of Warships which is yeah, yeah. sometimes pay, borderlines it's almost like pay to progress rather than yeah, pay to win yeah, yeah. yeah but certainly some of the really good premium stuff is locked behind and you're, it's like oh yeah I need to get HMS Hood because it's yeah. like oh it's 30 quid yeah brilliant HMS Hood I've paid 30 pounds which some years ago was the price of a AAA game yeah mm. for one digital ship within one game that yeah. I play mental yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I'm yeah. like, but I've got to have it. I've got to have War Spite and Hood and all yeah, these yeah. names from, you know, when I was a kid reading my dad's war books. Yeah, and you're like, but that's just bonkers. Yeah, yeah. But people pen, yeah. Oh, I don't know. It's difficult. So I think Fancast was, it was it was, a, no one was really very happy. I think about that process. I and, think uh, certainly from a, a a quality point of view and um, personal sort of like respect and quality when you when you're painting those things to go on packaging or in like armies and stuff and you just know the quality of the sculpt is 
because I, I think uh, granted the heavy metal painters are very clever they can hide a lot of their mistakes but there was a l with like decent paint jobs yeah. but there was a lot of prep so a lot of our armies were you know do we do this character or do we do two units because it's about the same amount of time yeah um, so sometimes you're like I'd rather see two more units of like 40 high elf spearmen than an, just another random high elf with a bow mm. as, a, as a character and it just makes it the prep makes painting even harder yeah. for people. You know, if it's not your job and you're trying to have a bit of fun of an evening or yeah. unwind painting a miniature and all you, you've got a whole load more prep to do, then that's just not very fun, is so it? So the benefits of Finecast is what I'm going to talk about now. Oh. And there's what, the, the one benefit I had of Finecast, and that was because I didn't like cleaning it up, I didn't like how they looked... That is where kit bashing came into its element with me. That's when my kit bashing, oh, okay. looking for lots of stuff that's plastified that I can get from other kits. So every character for my army became a plastic kit. Then it, well, I did an undead army at the time because me and Duncan and our gaming group were doing like a Blood, Blood in the Badlands campaign. And I'd got Krell, who's got his axe. I really yeah. like the, the look of Krell. And I got, I bought him um, because I like the look of him, but his axe kept snapping and it was like a, it was like a banana. So it, it, instead of it being the black acts of krell it was just like like timmy mallet's mallet it was rubbish because it just like sometimes it'd be bent that way sometimes it'd be bent that way and it was like nicely snugly fitted into my um my, my foam in my case there was nothing bending it but it was just like every now and again the heat would just make it bend depending where he was what conditions you're in and eventually it just snapped and broke off and i was like i can't be arsed this i'm making my own krell i'm making my own heinrich kemmler i'm making my own like vampire lord and i just got so much plastic stuff and I, that's when kit bashing mm. became my my forte and you know from then onwards the ventrally nobles became a thing and then just like mm. doing war bands and like cool conversions and stuff so i think Finecast launch padded me into doing more kit bashing necessity is the mother of invention yeah exactly so and it may well have accelerated plastic production as well yeah because they were like i would imagine if yeah. it was me, <laughs> we can't keep doing if it was this me, if it was me making those decisions i'd just let's just get this going on yeah yeah let's just get this going stop on. gap for now so i um back in the day <laughs> like last year um, <laughs> uh, when I subscribed to Warhammer Plus there was an episode of Hammer and Bolter where there was some striking scorpions and they killed a bunch of ultramarines and I was like oh they are, like, I was unfamiliar with the Eldar range and was like oh I'd like, I'll see if I can pick some up and then they arrived and, and yeah they were they were uh, fine cast and uh, I've just they've just been on a shelf ever since um, but if they were still selling them in fine cast but they're not are they like if they're not producing fine cast models anymore? Have they just been sat in stock for like decades? They'll be making them. They're just, still oh, making, so just they're still making just, fine cast. I think yeah. fine cast just isn't being promoted as a thing. Yeah, I think, yeah. and that was again we go back. to I think that was my problem with my major problem with it is it was promoted as this new amazing thing. Mm. And it's just, just to be honest about it, please. Yeah. And then I think did they put the prices up? Yeah, I think. And so. that was also that that probably. So now you're paying more money for something which for is a worse product. Inferior, for yeah. a worse product. Yeah. yeah, which is like come on. The, just going yeah. to the striking scorpions my favourite part of them is cleaning up the uh, chain blades because <laughs> you have to individually clean each tooth every bullet yeah every but bullet. then because it's so soft if you're not careful you end up snipping a tooth off and the weird thing is for something so small it's really noticeable isn't it oh yeah yeah. if, if you, you don't do it if you lose really a tooth noticeable. on a chain sword that, I've got a that might be a video in its own right just, <laughs> just me trying to clean up <laughs> I mean, yeah. just, just, film, just film you doing it all <laughs> ten parts of it you were saying not, not to use files and stuff and not use the um, like the brush and use like the mold line remover I end up getting some files and some really soft ones yeah. and just like because you get like the sort of hot flash bit and then like a bit of a curve mm. the files that do that so i'll just be like then every two play you go ch -ch -ch -ch. you get a bit of a flow going so you, and it did help but sometimes you weren't careful enough you did break the odd the odd tooth on the uh, it, yeah. again though it goes back to i think you go it's disgusting doesn't it you think we've got to go on a cost saving exercise so we're going to move to this inferior material and then it would in an attempt to save ourselves money, and then we're going to raise the price on the thing as well. Yeah, I don't think they, I don't think it was intentionally an inferior material. I just think no, no, no. Do I don't I mean? think it is. But so I'm, they, I'm, I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to defend the company. I'm just trying yeah. to be not disingenuous. Yeah, but I'm just saying they, yeah. they they had all as you say ultimately very quickly realised they were releasing something that wasn't very good. Yeah, and put the that's like me in my barbershop going from now on. I'm only doing shaved heads. They were ten pound before, but now they're twenty quid. And you go and you come in and think, I would like a quite a nice side part. Twenty pound. <laughs> you go, no, well it's not really. You know what I mean? It's like and you think you know, and that's what you're doing, aren't you? You've created something that's simpler or yeah. not exactly what someone wants. 
and charge them more money. Actually, the optics it. weren't very good, and they didn't. And they tried to tell people it was. And the consumers are bright enough to realise that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This this is not this is what you're saying. What you're telling me and what I'm receiving are, are not the same thing. So what what was like the again? Because I wasn't sort of I existed, but not you know whatever. Um, what was the public reaction to uh, Finecast? It I mean, was not you're good. You're both smiling. <laughs> um, it's difficult to know because I was I was in the studio, which is quite a kind of cosseted protected yeah. environment and you're, you're kind of told not to go looking on I mean we did we yeah, had we a computer did. <laughs> <laughs> at the time I think Warseer Daka Daka were quite big at that time yeah, as well yeah. um, that, that you know you used, used those as a judge I think that was when Facebook we had a fa- we started to get back into Facebook maybe because I know we had Facebook for a time stopped it and then we introduced uh, it again it but the individual stores all had yeah. Facebook accounts yeah and then that's that, that pre-YouTube I think it yeah, would be, yeah, probably yeah. for the best, really. I can't remember. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I wouldn't have been. Because Duncan, when he moved over, we were we were downstairs. So Finecast happened when we were upstairs in in what was the design studio. We then split to hobby products, miniatures, books and box games, and we went down to miniatures. And Finecast obviously was still in its. It, Did you go with miniatures? I, yeah, yeah. We, we, which is a thing we, we never agreed with, which was stupid uh, for different reasons. Well, welcome to. Um, but yeah, so Finecast was still quite prevalent then when we we're downstairs, and that's when then Duncan got went off to go and do Warmer TV with Rog. Yep. So YouTube, I think when it first came out, it was pre YouTube, mm-hmm. at least Warmer TV YouTube as we know it. I did yeah. the first Games Workshop Studio YouTube video. Did you? Yeah, I don't it's, remember it's that. still on YouTube. If you look for GW Studio, you can find a video called Large Man Test. Right. Which is when we released the big plastic realm of battle boards. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And it's filmed in one of the little, one of the little, one, one take, thank you very much. Yeah. Filmed in the, one of the uh, old meeting rooms and Gabriel comes in. Good old Gabriel. I've got a white coat on. Gabriel comes in. I put, I put the, the big realm of battle boards on the floor because everyone, we thought everyone would be concerned about whether they were strong enough. And Gabriel jumps up and down on them. And then leaves the room, and I tick, do a big tick and hold it to the camera. Yeah. And it was like GW, GW Studio <laughs> YouTube account, and that was it. Were was you like, there for the hard case? Yes. Uh, and Roger and Duncan, it was filming, like, I think they had a sledgehammer or something like that, and they had to hit it, yeah. and they broke it. Yeah. And then Dave was like, <laughs> well, well, we'll hide that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we won't show that footage. Not far off before I left. <laughs> Um, that's how you solve a problem the hard case anything even a sledgehammer poof, broke it uh, we won't show that bit <laughs> so chucking it in the canal yeah chucked it in the canal with heavy what, what, did they put miniatures in it I can't remember because I'm sure someone said like put miniatures in it and then they took oh they took a load of heavy metal stuff, stuff. yeah yeah shh it's yeah. about £7,000 worth of miniatures. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And they threw it into a canal. <laughs> into the canal. I can't remember. This could all be just lies. I can't oh, remember okay. if the models were taken out just to be on the safe side. Because if Duncan was there doing the footage, I think he would have had the the, the wires to go. Oh, okay. mm, probably not a good call, especially with the hammer. I'm glad that that probably didn't have miniatures in it at the time as well. Oh, yeah. In the sledgehammer. Yeah. Um, so, so you mentioned earlier you wanted to talk about some cases and stuff should we talk about yeah Yeah. oh yeah yeah. I think because it's nice segue from case to case because I was just thinking of doing it then he he jumped in there I was like yeah he's he's on it Um, (laughs) it's because it's a you you laid that trail of breadcrumbs and I gobbled them up (laughs) it's a nice illustration of some of the stuff we talked about on the last episode the game Hobby Trumpet Broad End Broad End Games Workshops Group Margin um, Markup whoever you want to call it Um, and they've just released I've just seen they've released the new little tiny one, mm. which I haven't had my hands on, so I'm not going to say if it's any good or not because I haven't even played with it, seen one. Um, no, it does use it does use a, a technique we developed a long, long, long time ago mm. to hold the miniatures, or we looked at doing a long, long, long time ago to the miniatures. But figure cases are difficult. Um, and, of course, the first thing everyone goes to is magnets. Mm. Use magnets. And mm. yeah, okay, well... Um, yeah. Sorry. So, go, go, go. so, so we use magnets. So we, yeah, the first thing everyone turns to is use magnets. And for a for an experienced user, it probably is probably is the way to go. Yeah. Um, but you got to bear in mind that if we're looking at broad end or hobby trumpet, we're looking at fourteen year olds um, and up, fourteen yeah. to twenty year olds. And most Games Workshop products are classed as toys, mm-hmm. fall under toy safety regulations, and are, a lot of them are sold in trade accounts, which are actually. Uh, toy shops yeah so we see things like element games and those people which are dedicated hobby specialists at the time we did it most of the retailers or the trade accounts were actually small mum and pop toy shops 
or conglomerations of toy shops. Mm. Um, and to go into a toy shop, something's got to be a toy. Yeah. Well, it's self-evident, right? Um, and I can never say it. Neo D D M. Rare earth magnets. There we go. That's a better word. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> rare earth mag. Really strong rare earth. Rare earth magnets are not are not very toy safety friendly. You no. may remember some of you may remember. Particularly if you've got kids, you may remember a few, number of years ago there was a massive issue with there were some really good kind of cool kiddies magnetic toys that snapped together, and people were buying cheaper versions of the good stuff, yeah. but the magnets in them weren't encapsulated within the mouldings. So the good ones, the magnets were fully sealed into the mouldings, and you could build towers and things and little doggies and things yeah. out of them. The cheaper ones, they just glued them in yeah um and kiddies well, the first thing kiddies do is they chew on things yeah and then, then they get a magnet in them yeah which isn't bad to start off one with. magnet isn't too bad yeah, yeah. yeah that'll pass through oh two two magnets mm. and if they're little rare earth strong magnets in a gut one's yeah. this part down that one's oh, that part cranky. down really bad oh but wow didn't they say it's like a gunshot wound <laughs> Somewhere along those lines, because it's like like that. Because because I've got like loads of rare earth magnets for doing glue, and I did some stuff like with a, a servitor when we did like this weird sort of Alexa thing for Warmer TV. And from this distance, they just slapped together really fast right, for the loud internally noise. Internally, in a baby, yeah, really bad, yeah, or in anyone. So, do you know what though? I was just thinking how entertaining the game would be if they swallowed one knew they had and then you had one on the outside and it's always for like <laughs> operations you got it all the way back out it comes out like a chest burst yeah. <laughs> well, it's one way of getting rid of it yeah. uh, you've got to be really uh, careful yeah, yeah. sure and part of the problem, for the nose to go yeah. so part from the magnetising figures to put into a case is yeah. that you need to individually magnetise them mm. so from us in, as, well, for Games Workshop to do magnetised bases they'd probably have to magnetise the bases at source mm. and the magnets would need to be fully encapsulated as part of the moulding process done so yeah. they're, they're done yeah. in which case swallowing them is suddenly not a problem and it's not also it's not just the user you've got to bear in mind that when you risk assess you've got to look at certainly because you've got to risk any product that goes onto the market theoretically should be risk assessed mm. Whether companies do that or not is up to them, but they should have risk assessed it, and they should assess what the biggest risk is. So you'll see in every Games Workshop box, essential sharp points, risk of choking or something. Mm. Or on, on all the hobby tools it says you may stab yourself. Yeah, well, but you've got to, there's a whole process that you need to go through to risk assess a product. And you've got to look at the risk, so chew magnet, and what's the hazard. So there's the hazard, which is what, what, what's, what's the thing that's going to happen, and then there's the risk, what's the likelihood of that happening, mm. and that's a risk assessment. And every product Games Workshop puts out has a risk assessment associated with it. And also, every product that Games Workshop puts out goes to toy safety compliance. <laughs> yeah. It goes off to third parties who get paid a lot of money to do things like they even check the ink. So they'll check if the, they'll check if the manufacturer has used safety compliant ink or is it just full of lead oh, and right. stuff like that. Okay. Are, are, are there sharp points? Can they crush their fingers? Can they swallow it? There's a whole load of, uh, there's a whole load of tests that go through. Um, most a lot of Games Workshop toys, toys, toy soldiers. People get offended if I call them toys. Games Workshop toys, but toys in, in the kind of sense of them as consumer items being sold into a shop, have essential sharp points. Because in order for a spear to look like a spear, yeah. it needs to look like a, mm. and in order for a, a miniature to be a miniature, it needs to be of a certain size. They would fail. No, they would normally fail a toy safety test, but because they're it's they have to be that thing to be a thing. That's fine. And also the risk of a plastic spear isn't very much yeah i'll tell you what didn't get risk assessed it was the old sit as a death scenery <laughs> it probably was at the uh, time when that, he's a <laughs> yeah so they, they had um you get like buttresses and like um banisters and stuff like that and you have like these spiky bits that come out and they'll so sharp so when we were making the gaming tables for retail um it, it was like dangerous but when you were like doing intro gaming you'd reach over and you just get a scratch on <laughs> yeah. your arm um and they were like so we had to file them all down but i remember we did uh, i think it was the 30th anniversary of warhammer um or it could have been 40k and we we were all told in the region to do something called the truck of luck where you get like a cardboard big cardboard <laughs> box and you put a hole in it we sprayed it we 40, 40k fired it and then we just put loads of sprues in and then kids were able to go into the truck of luck and pull a sprue out the amount of like just torn up arms <laughs> that the kids went in to pull out a sprue so and they'll sharp. be like they'll be like fussling in they'll come out they'll just be covered in blood that was fine apparently <laughs> my um, Jesus my favourite ever toy being adapted because it was too dangerous was the um going back a bit now but was the um the f the fighter spaceship from um buck rogers that the f at the front of them the guns either side of them ended in two 
points basically and there was like rockets around them and they were like that so when you bought this this toy it was like like that and the cockpit was in the middle and when they to release it to the public and as a kid I never understood why it didn't look like it did when mm. in the show it had a big metal bar between the yeah, two yeah 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 uh, so yeah so you couldn't turn <laughs> your eyes or it to somebody you get, you get, to stop someone being stabbed with these two points oh, down wow. yeah. you get a lot of stuff like that yeah. you risk assess something and it's be- you're better off risk assessing really early a lot of companies see it as a real annoyance and it is annoyance but generally all the regulations are there toy safety regulations are there for a good reason generally yeah. because someone's died yeah right this is, yeah. This is so we don't ma- want to kill kids with toys so loose magnets really <laughs> bad yeah so we looked at we're like okay so we, we, we went dumb we could see the magnetising base was, was a really way good of transporting miniatures but one it was again money comes in other people are already doing this process and they have less overheads because they're just selling you magnets yeah and you can make you one out of a really good box company thing with a bit of tin stuck in it and glue your magnets on yourself. Yeah. We co- how do we compete with that yeah, on yeah. a cost? But you can't really. Yeah. yeah. Uh, unless we do it from the original, and then every single base that Games Workshop produces has magnets built into it from the beginning, and that's quite. That would have been quite cool. Yeah. But no, there's a cost there, in that, isn't and there? And there was a cost in that. No. Yeah. No. Just not doing that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, and then we had to look at other ways of competing, because again, there's other people who are making stuff, and they have much smaller margins, so we can't compete with it. Yeah. So the way we decided to compete was on efficiency. So how many effectively, how many models can you get into your case per pound or dollar, euro, whatever? That was the way to compete. And we could do that by using large plastic mouldings and bits and bobs. Um, and then the other one, so then we went out and looked at everybody's display, everyone's figure cases and mm. got them in and played with them. And loads of people had custom foam, which is all well and good. But when you, as soon as you, the minute you change your army... yeah. I mean, it's probably the best, you know, other than magnets, having custom foam cases, whether it's custom cut for your army into a case, probably great. But then every time you get a new unit or every time you you change your army, your foam is then yeah. is then irrelevant. Or your dreadnought's cut for one size, but then you want to change the arm and actually your custom cut foam hole for your dreadnought arm doesn't actually fit anymore. So we had to get rid of that. And then we went out and bought loads of... Then we went mental. And this is where the new one, I find the new mm. one quite funny, that we went out and bought a load of... We just tried everything. And one of the ones we tried was bristles. Yes, I remember so you doing the bristle been, one. Yeah, so like, you were coming. Why have you got like yeah, seventeen <laughs> brooms stuck to a bit, of, stuck to a board? Because we lit, went out and bought a load of bristles, and we're just dropping miniatures into bristles to see if it would work. Oh. And then you close it. Yeah, with other bristles. Wasn't with other bristles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. other bristles on top. And we bought, tried everything. And then there was. A, then we did. I think we did. One of the designers did that kind of version, and it was kind of worked on a kind of small model by model basis, but. We had some, some sort of governance on kind of we need to fit. We decide. I think we either decide we need to fit ninety nine percent of the models in the range. If we went for one hundred percent of the models in the range, you're never going to be able to do yeah, it because yeah. you'll end up with some really weird, massive thing. Mm. So we're like, okay, so what's the most common model? I think it was a shadow sword. Mm. Um, so the the kind of the whole kind of block system is based around ninety nine percent models, getting mm. as many men in, I mean men, little men, into those things as possible for the price that you're paying. At baking it as flexible as possible, those are the things. Because we could have sold specifics. And there were a couple of special figure cases that went out for special projects that which mm. were custom cut. Yeah. Um, but, they were, yeah, they only hold those things. Was the uh, Dark Vengeance one? Might have been, yeah. Yeah, yeah the Dark Vengeance <laughs> one. Then it old, only held the contents of that product. Yeah, that box, yeah. You know, yeah. Okay, it's nice, but, you know. But there's so much void space yeah. as well, which is a, a bit of a shame. And then, so, this new one, forget the name, but... It certainly harks back to some of that work we did back then on mm. bristles, and we tried loads of different methods. And eventually, foam just was the way to do it. Uh, for for our pur- I know it's but a lot of people don't like foam, yeah, can rub but- miniatures. But for our purpose, it was the right way of doing it. Mm. And then we're looking at the slot. If people remember the old one, it had loads of little slots, yeah. which didn't fit anything anymore because well, all the miniatures had got bigger. Yeah, I mean, I, I still prefer that, and I use it, and it's so universal for yeah. everything. Um, because I was thinking about that, there was the red foam, which had like I think eight slots in a row. Then it went to the grey foam, which ended up having nine. So you got an extra. I, I think they made the the foam a little bit thinner, yep. so you end up getting more slots. And I always like that because if I had a bike, I just like I'd get a knife, a sharp knife, and cut one of the boards in the middle, flip it, yeah, yeah, put a jet bike in it. It's protected. But then if I wanted more troops, I can just like put it back, back and glue it. So I always used to do that. And with my Napoleonics, I can fit four because uh, I was multi no I don't multi base my loose base them um, so I can get like four in a slot of like 
two or three. Uh, so what should be two figures, I can get like four to five uh, Napoleonics in there. So um, Yeah, I mean, it's great for infantry, but since you start getting dreadnoughts, tanks, yeah, other stuff... that's what cardboard boxes with tissue and paper And then you start for. cutting <laughs> holes and... I like can't the big one. Yeah. The big one with the zigzag. Yeah, so there's, yeah, so there's right, a yeah. tank in that. Yeah. So the zigzag foam, I worked on that project with a few people, and we're just looking at getting as men, getting as much... Getting as many miniatures into as small a space as possible. Yeah. That's why it's got the two layers. And yeah. Also, there's some efficiencies because the different bits of foam are cut from the same foam, so we're not we're not like wasting foam. It's all it's all quite sensibly done. The wave foam we had an intern that actually came up with this. It was a strap system, and then we did the wiggly foam, which, oh, which worked yeah. really well. Um, well, some people don't like it. Some people do. I mean, it it, it kind of goes back eventually to its wiggliness. Yeah. So if you do put like a big tank in there for a transport, it yeah. makes a void. You go in there. If you leave it there forever, then it will start Stay, to hold yeah. that shape. But yeah. But yeah, for the short term, you, I like that. The only thing I was with that was always to sharpen, take a breath at the price of one. But yeah, yeah, I, but it's funny cases though. The, the great case. The funny story about one of them was I bought one off um, eBay. A guy was selling one really cheap, and I went down there and he really looked after it. I had the strap, shoulder strap, everything, and I thought to myself, "That's a really good deal." I was really pleased because I've been on and on about buying a brand <laughs> new one. And I bought this one off him and I was so happy. I got it for such a good price and it was in such good nick. And then I went from West Bridgeford back to going around to visit my mate. And on the way home, not knowing it was different to the area where I live, drove down the bus lane and got fined for more money than it would have cost me to just go and buy a brand new one from Games Workshop. you got to go... Sounds mm. there. Yeah. 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 So they're made in China. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest, so another, so other than efficiency, we, we couldn't compete on other things, on yeah. price. We had to compete on if it, how many getting models in. The other thing we had to worry about was getting it from China. Mm. So kind of the reason it's the shape it is, those foam blocks, because it's based around shipping from China. So it's about maximising shipping volume per miniature from China into Lenten. Mm. And that's why they're that, and yeah. the, the shape is optimised for filling up a 40-foot container. This is where we had to think. Yeah. To, to compete on Games Workshop margin, we had to go into the size of how many can we stick on a pallet, get into a thing, and how do we maximise the... Because shipping air is rubbish. You want to you yeah. ship as little air as possible, as well as making it manufacturable. So the sides are as steep as they could be to get it out of the injection moulding machine. Mm. Otherwise, we'd have made it steeper. But we had to... That, that's, that was mandated by... Yeah. So the whole thing was yeah. built around these, these, and that's, I think a lot of people who are smaller don't have to worry about this sort of stuff. And we really did, just to, just to compete. And there were good cases, you know, mm. they, 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 and also there's skulls on, you know, skulls yeah. are cool. Need skulls. Need skulls. Absolutely. Um, we know this from last time. <laughs> <laughs> and then the block, the, you know, the block, but the block also was built to take a shadow sword effectively. Yeah, yeah. But also, ma again, maximise internal volume. So we're like, you know, literally calculating how many miniatures can we get onto a 40 foot container. Yeah. That's kind of the way we had to do it in order to get to get the cost efficiency. And also shipping, it's not got to, it's got to go from the warehouse in China to the dock, from the, onto a boat over here, off the boat, onto a lorry into Lenton, in, or wherever they're distributing from now, East Mids, and back, then back out again. There's all this shipping, and every time you ship, you've got to pay for air. And no one likes paying for it. Air is just expensive. Yeah. <laughs> <gasps> And it's almost, it's almost, if you're coming in from China, one of the biggest costs, with a lot of hobby stuff, certainly because that's where most of it's made, is is shipping. Yeah. That impacts everything. Mm. So you're really restricted on what you can do in terms of shipping. I remember the, uh, the sort of dilemmas of when we're doing, and this is like from books and box point of view, when you're making a product like a codex or um, some kind of like rule book or whatever, you have your deadlines and I always used to get really frustrated if you can if it's called a deadline it's a deadline it shouldn't move it's a deadline it it's not like a whimsical sort of like line that like writers can suddenly go oh, I've got a couple of extra weeks after though haven't I it's like no it's a deadline because repro have got to get that done and sent off so then it can start being printed uh, and there were so many times where it just seemed that the deadline was flexible but then after that it became like we'll have to either air freight which Ooh. was expensive <sighs> yeah or then go to i think it was hicklin and squires at the time where yep. you'd print uk which was also expensive part of me is like stand up another uk business or, or whatever if, did if you look at the it case. they did look at buying a printers yeah well i remember there was a time when i went i was at uni 
and we went to a printer's and they were producing lots of Black Library books. And they're like, oh yeah, we, we, we I must have been Hickling and Squires. I, I don't remember it now, it was so long ago. Um, but I remember distinctly going, oh, I didn't realise they make Games Workshop stuff here. And they're like, oh yeah, we do White Dwarfs and this, that and the other from time to time. So it must have been like one of the ones when it was like it wasn't being air freighted. No, sorry, one, shipped. One of my mates in the pub used to be a director at Hickling and Squires. Hmm. Quite funny, he remembers it. He remembers the buyers. The attack buyers very well. So they were very good, but they were definitely quite hot on price. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was, yeah. So there's, I think one, one of the things I wanted to bring up was just because the, the, these things aren't made in isolation. We, don't, we didn't make arbitrary decisions as yeah, to why. Yeah. Mm. We really hurt, we understood, and, and the group margin was a pain, was a pain, as a designer, it's a pain. In, in some regards, it's quite nice because it, it forces you to be, to work harder. Yeah. So it's a harder check. When, when you have no restrictions, it's you can yeah. faff around a lot more and be unrestricted. When you, yeah. it forces you to, to be a bit cleverer. But it was very difficult sometimes. And some products we just could not make. Yeah, you know, I won't go into it in great length. But we always wanted to do a display item, some form of cabinet. We looked at it loads of times, loads, three, three, four times. But when you when you go, what you walk into an IKEA, mm. yeah. and there's several cases the, you got the, your the, in this room. <laughs> How the hell you compete with that? Yeah. And those glass cabinets that used to be forty quid—they yeah. were actually everywhere in Games Workshop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. still are. They still yeah. are. Yeah. There were a load of forty. You're like, how do we compete with that? Yeah, that's virtually impossible to compete with that with that level. You know, uh, on 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 the margin that that the Games Workshop demanded. Yeah, mm. at a price that then people would then pay for it, which is yeah. the well, it's not what you talked about airbrushes. You know, you, you basically have to buy an airbrush to then st- slap a sticker on it and maybe a skull to then sell it at a profit, um, which is then you might as well just get the airbrush from the source because it's, like, if much we cheaper. We could have done, we would have done. It wasn't like Games Workshop. But then, but then because Games Workshop... It, there was some knock-on effects because Games Workshop didn't sell an airbrush. You couldn't really talk about airbrushing a lot. Yeah, yeah. And there actually was a lot of people airbrushing. Yeah. Oh, internally, well, because it made a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they were the masses. They even did a book about airbrushing. <laughs> <laughs> And a range of paints <laughs> for um, yeah, airbrushing. Yeah, I always go, I gravitate towards them as much as possible. Yeah, they're great paints. I've got loads of them. It's really, really quite frustrating. So it was very frustrating. Yeah, I can imagine. It, it, um, yeah, but it made you think harder. I guess was the was the message. And things things were things were generally done for a good reason. Yeah. And I'm, again, it goes back to that. Things had, maybe the outcome wasn't the best, but the decision making along the along the time was generally for. A good reason or for the right reason it's just what we yeah. got out the end was, was yeah. maybe maybe affected by by those commercial realities you know yeah, yeah. That other well, people didn't have to worry about i would have never have thought in the designing of a case i mean it, the way you explain it, it it seems quite obvious like with the size of games workshop and all that stuff but it's like design a figure case but also taking into account how many you can fit in a container like yeah. that that thought would wouldn't have crossed my mind uh when i'd look at a shop and and go should i buy a figure case no, but um, for a consumer, it doesn't yeah. matter. No, no what matters to you yeah. is can will it safely yeah. hold my models at a cost I'm prepared to pay? <clears throat> yeah, and is it convenient for me to use? Mm. For a business, it's a totally different story. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Just touching back on like the um, the, the thing where you're saying where you, you have to like think, be clever, and think around these like, kind of things. I remember when we moved um, mostly to plastic scenery, there was lots of plastic scenery because prior to that we were like kit bashing and scratch building scenery so using polystyrene using like glasgow foam using like balsa wood plastic card i remember the day when the timber like you can't do any of that anymore you have to use plastic kits and you have to use them creatively that kind of made you push yourself a bit more to to like how do i build a cool exciting board using what have we got on range for 40k nothing but imperial ruins cool let's make a cool board that's Kind of imperial, but not okay. <laughs> it's a tower board. How do we make this tower? But we've only got imperial ruins, so sometimes you have to be quite clever about how you went doing it and this that, and even like making like foundations of. You could do some sc- uh, scratch building, but the majority of that had to be Citadel product. And I remember there was the rule of if it's for the first month of White Dwarf of release, you don't mess with the kit. If it's the yeah. second month, you can mess with it a little bit and if it's the third month onwards then you can go to town so then we um did a didn't go particularly well because the person that did it didn't follow the brief but we were doing a vampire counts board and we had a roma battle and the first two by four sorry yeah two by four section because we it was six by four so we did like two board strip two board strip two board strip the first two boards were just the, the the kits that were sold 
not molested uh, or converted or anything like that. They're just as they are in the box, painted up looking cool. The second section of the board was like a little bit of like, I'm going to get the graveyard ruins and stick them into the wood i'm going to get this so it's all using the same kit mixing it together and then the third part of the board was just like scratch build a vampire castle um and the person that didn't didn't do a particular uh, great job they, they don't work for us anymore or work for them anymore um because they were awful at it um but that it, it was like they just didn't follow the brief but that was the mentality we, we yep. would do was like you do so much of which is not messed around with have a bit of play and then go to town um I remember actually, uh, we were doing, I think Neil Hodgson had done the uniform and heraldry guide for Skaven. And there was like all the different oh, Skaven clans and stuff in there. And there was great they, books. They were, they were, I wish we did it. I say we. It took so much work. It was all like the graphic design elements that were all separate. Like every face was separate. Every helmet was separate. Every um, like oh. um, plume was, was separate. They were amazing. There was a point though, I remember one of them was really late. And every single graphic designer in the studio yeah. or anyone had been anywhere near a graphics program was colouring in. Yeah, we were like literally colouring in the first one. I think it might be the Empire one. Yeah, we're just colouring in everything. Brilliant! It was just bonkers. Yeah, like, I remember that for this book that didn't. It was beautiful. It didn't sell very much. Yeah, it sold. It sold well, but it didn't sell well enough for the whole studio to be colouring in for a month. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is one way to put it. It was just like, what the hell is going on? That's why they didn't go because they, just, yeah. they took, didn't fly because because the original intention was to do a Heldry book for every single release. Yeah, yeah. But they just took so much. Well, the when we did the um, how to paint guides, they were to accompany a codex. Yeah. They were like 12 quid um, and no one bought them. And I think some of that was they weren't allowed, to, uh, store staff weren't allowed to open a copy, so they couldn't promote it because they oh, didn't know God, what yeah. it was. Um, Staying at cellophane. Yeah. So, because I'd be in the shop and there'll be a guy going, Oh, I really want to learn how to paint like such and such. And, I, and I'd hear the staff member going, Well, I don't know. Duncan's not done a guide yet. And I'm like, There's these books here. There's a book right there that's got four paint guides in it. And they're like, Oh, what book's that then? I'm like, Ah! <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't know because they weren't told. Um, but yeah, going back to the um, the Skaven book, there was like loads of clans in it. And there was a cool one called Clan Scurvy, which is like Pirate Skaven had a nice mustardy yellow kind of scheme, and we were told to do an army uh, for for workshop for to go on the web to go in White Dwarf and stuff. So it was like kit bash it, go mad. So I kit bashed it, and I made like loads of pirate sort of. So I used the Storm Vermin kits, the Clan Rat kits, gave them peg legs. Tried to get like the Empire sort of like pirate hats and stuff like. I gave them like hooked hands. Most of them had muskets. Um, using Empire bits as well. And then I was like, oh, I want some rat ogres, but I don't want just normal rat ogres. I want fish rat ogres. So I got the river trolls. There's three river trolls in the set and then two rat ogres. So I got the two kits and then just like munch them together to make fish looking rat ogres. Uh, if you can imagine a fish that's a rat that <laughs> kind of looks... Scaven I had to work with him <laughs> <laughs> as did you <laughs> I, I asked permission I was like I want to get these two kits and make a cool rat ogre unit out of it and my manager was like that sounds cool I'll, I'll ask my manager his manager was like yeah that sounds wicked I did him I finished it put him in the cabinet and then my boss's boss saw him and was like they look great love him amazing very scaven very sort of like out there and then someone else, which I won't name, wandered by and went, what is this? Perish. Got really angry because no one would do that. No one would buy two kits to convert. No one does that in the hobby, apparently. That's what I was told. Um, no one would buy this kit and this kit because it's wasteful. I was like, yeah, but I've used everything. I've, nothing's gone to waste. I've used everything in the set. Uh, so nothing's got, gone to waste. And then the manager that said, that's really good, put me into a meeting room to tell me off to say it wasn't very good. And I was like, but you just told me it was good and I asked you and you said it was okay. I was like, yeah, but I've been told it's not. So it's not your opinion, it's the opinion you've been given. But yeah, so I was just like, I'm not happy with that. Uh, so what, what, what's happening is like, well, we might have to look at like, you know, escalating it to a uh, p performance management issue. And I'm like, well, if anyone should be performance managed, it's you. Because yep. I'm the one that asked permission. You said yes. And then you applauded me for doing it in the cabinet. Only because someone else has said it's bad. You suddenly changed your mind. Uh, he didn't last very long either. You might never recognise who it is. It was at that point when he collapsed in the room due to the fact someone had removed his backbone. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Not out of backbone. But mm. Yeah, there was a few like that. But yeah, I, I used to love like um, getting the opportunity to get existing kits and then making stuff from it as opposed to scratch. But I, I found it actually more, um, I guess, in, uh, what's the word? Challenging? Yeah, yeah. challenging. You that, sort of have to. I mean, going back to that fine cast thing, I think with the removal of metal miniatures and fine cast, there's less options. Hmm. Like there's one Eldar Farseer. Yeah. I need more than one Eldar Farseer in yeah, my yeah. army. There's one Shadowseer. Yeah. I need one, I need more than one Shadowseer. When I've converted 
my second fast year into a shadow seer because then at least then I've got another shadow seer model I can buy off the shelf. And I did it by snipping, cutting down the fast ear's face and moving the vein and then filling in the face plate with the super glue method that you talked about earlier. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, so he's got a completely smooth front, yeah. like, like, like the wraith guard that he hangs around with. But there's only one option, and that's one of the things I, I miss about having metal miniatures around, is there would be f six warlocks, yeah. and it didn't matter. Yeah. Can, and each of them would be individuals. And I think this is maybe where um, it's, it's something we've discussed a little bit, is, is kind of like upgrade sprues versus third-party like 3D printed bits. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of those kind of are geared towards Space Marines at the moment. Um, like, is it Great Tide Studios have done... Um, uh, stuff for the space wolves, the primal and, wolves, or something. Yeah, like that. yeah, that's yes, primal wolves. <laughs> all accidentally fit perfectly on your miniatures. I love some um, of those names people come up with. They're brilliant. Yeah, yeah and and oh, I've got a lot in my head. Bob, <laughs> Bob, mate, Naismith, when he was on the channel, came up with a, a name for something that we've used pretty much a lot ever since, which was the the Aldi. When they try to get as close to the name of something without copyrighting yeah. it. And he called Biscuits McSquitties, didn't he? Yeah. Right? And we've used it a lot so often. I was in Aldi the other day. I thought I was going to pass out. Their, their Dr. Pepper copy is called Professor Peppy. I, thought I, was, I honestly thought I was going to have an aneurysm in the middle of the shop. I was laughing so much because all I was just getting was Bob's head. Have you seen their LucasAid? It's called Explosive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You drink that with a name like that, so that's a warning. Yeah, Explosive. It's great. Yeah. yeah, but you know what? You say that about the warlock. So we have to spare a thought for people who collect space marine lieutenants. Yeah. You know what I mean? Have any got? Oh, damn, those space marine players. 12, but only 11 or 12 of them to worry about. <laughs> space marine players with their entirely limited miniature range. Oh, yes. Tell you, I don't yeah. choice. An entirely plastified range. So I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if there are, um, yeah, like 3D printed sort of, or, or proxies that you could use for well, different... There's a whole range of ancient, ancient and stuff. space men that look a bit like elves out there. Uh, yeah. Particularly for the stuff which is still in... Resin, fine cost, yeah. like fire dragons and stuff. I've seen the oh, other yeah, range, yeah. and the, there's some really nice miniatures out there that sell close enough, but are still aesthetically distinct enough mm. as well, I think. Yeah. Because there's got to be people. There's a whole other discussion to be heard about stuff like that. But things changed with Chapter House when that happened, because then suddenly every single option had to be in the box. Yeah. <clears throat> um, miniatures, I think, I think you've talked about it previously, about some of the miniatures are less poseable now. Yeah. But that's because the shoulder pads are moulded in with Insignia on. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You can't change them. Yeah. You could, but you'd have to do a lot of work. Yeah, 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 but that yeah. automatically takes all, takes all the bits people out yeah. because you can't go swapping your shoulder pads around yeah. as, as freely as you could do. Or they're moulded into the arm in a way that you can't just pop the shoulder pad off. That's very deliberate as a result. Yeah. Uh, would have been very deliberate as a result of that court case. You know? I, I think when that first happened, seeing those push fit figures or those like, they can only be fitted or built in one way um, was quite jarring to me when I first started because I used to like like swapping heads around and like swapping bodies and oh, I'm going to put these legs with that torso and these arms with that body and this, that and the other. And there's still some kits that do that. But I've now just found it more of a challenge just to like go, apparently I can only build these models in one way. I will see Is if that that's true. Actually the case. Yeah. And Sister Battle are a great example of that because they come across as like being like, you can only build them in this pose, you can only build them in that pose. But actually I've got quite a lot of kit bashing and modularity out of the kits that there's so much choice because all oh, their head fit is the same as the arms are the same if you and usually their torso they have like a little bit of a basque kind of bit that comes down but if you can cut around that and do that on every model with like a little modeling saw it yep. works with the skirts and the uh, the bodies and stuff so there's always a way around I mean, it but a lot of stuff if you've got the skill you can do you can do what you want I yeah that's the, that's i gotta be honest i find it hard now to keep bits whereas it used to be just used to go right Bag, you know, they're the old fashioned money bags. Yeah. Bag yeah. full of arms, bag full yeah. of heads, bag full of. Now, because even multi part Marines, there's just a bit of a twist in the torso and an arm is just slightly higher. I'm now going to keep sprues of everything. Mm. I'm not only going to keep the sprue, but where I have to collect all the sprues together and then keep the instructions in there with mm. them. Or, because... you, or you match the arms together in little baggies because you know that arm connects yeah, with that yeah, arm and you can't like have more. Oh, I don't I'm, I'm mental I'm, you just <laughs> hate my bits back it's chaos I clip everything off and put it about because then it enforces me to like <laughs> think about the posing a bit more yeah. um, but usually you can find like the, the an offset arm that kind of like works better with it but yeah I'm I temper scions um, I ended up just because I'd un 
clipped them all out and then realised that like certain backpacks went with certain guns because the, the way the cable connected and I was like I'm just cutting the cable off the backpack and the gun it's just a mag now <laughs> there's no cable yes. well just yeah I, I'm I, 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 I haven't got enough hours in my day to start sitting there going is that the right arm for that yeah. I just leave everything on a sprue now and hope for the best that oh, when I come back to it it'll work but, yeah, it does yeah. take up so much space though. that's the problem doesn't it they do yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember having a blitz of my bits box because so I used to have like these Royal Mail uh, boxes I don't know how Liz got old of them but she did and they used to be filled full of sprues and I used to have loads of them and then I ended up just doing a cull and just like putting them into baggies and this sort of space of like sprues turned into this Yeah, and I was like oh <laughs> I've yeah. got loads more room to buy more product yeah. that I'll never build absolutely right um, which I do build darling if you're watching <laughs> do build it <laughs> <laughs> lovely um, I think we can move on to some Patreon questions. Now. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, we forgot all about the Patreon. Sorry, guys. And we have um, a lot. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Do you want to condense all the cheese ones into one question? Well, we've done the cheese, yeah. haven't we? Oh, oh, it'll, it, come yeah. back, it'll come yeah. back. There was a well, sausage one. I saw a sausage one. All oh, right. Okay. People have done um, uh, multiple multiple variants of the cheese question. Yeah. So we'll see. Um, see, we go. see what See Challenge. what goes on there. Um, so it's a real shame uh, the tubs of static grass sand and snow and slate disappeared from GW's product line uh, it used to be a fun addition to base design and my DIY sort of projects do you have any thoughts on the replacement of this to base texture and tufts yeah so camera's dead. we wanted again it's one of those what's unique about that or that offer this, yeah. was, this was my. This was, I remember this project, and one of the things was what's unique about our offer that you can't buy somewhere else. You can go and buy all of that stuff in another store, and it's, there's nothing unique about it mm. in reality. Um, the tasks were custom made, but if you're buying loads of spits of slate and stuff, it, I think it kind of worked when you went, when we had the kind of the, we bought a City of Death set, which had some custom resin bits mm. and some brass etch yeah, yeah. and some fake barbed wire. Yeah, I remember and those, that, yeah. They were kind of more fun because that. Again, you could add the value, add the value, put my skulls in it, but you could add the value there. Whereas if it's just flock and stuff, it yeah. was kind of like it's, you can get everyone else's flock. In fact, all we were doing is selling everyone else to the same flock as everyone else yeah. in a different container. The tubs were like uh, food containers. They were like taramasalata and tzatziki yeah, yeah. and hummus <laughs> containers we bought from somewhere. Amazing. That's, I, all, that's, that's all those were. I used to be but, quite naughty when I was in the Derby store. Um, you get like parents coming in going, oh, my son's after some sand because it'd be like the Christmas purchases, the follow-on sales and stuff like that. After some sand, I was like, you could spend £5 getting this tub, you can just go to the pet shop and get it for 50p. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What I love budgie sand because it's got all little yeah, bits in it as well. Yeah. So it doesn't just sit all just yeah. well. We, we all did it. It's and dead you, fine, isn't it? Yeah, it's, yeah. It, well, it's, yeah, it's, it's that. I think that's the great thing about it. Is it's, it's really fine, where some of the stuff is quite coarse. But I, what I've done now is I get like a jar of multiple different sands of different grits. Yeah, yeah. That's and then move. I just like shake it all in. So you've got like loads of fine sand, some bigger bits, some chunky bits. So when you're baiting, it looks more natural, a little bit more scattered. Mm. Um, but yeah, I remember those uh, six yeah. death things. We, I even did the ice one, and then Duncan did the oh, yeah, desert did, one. Steve did the jungle one. With the crystals and all yeah, that. Yeah, get, get five, four hobbyists in a room and just go. Here's a load of bits. Just make some basing kits. I was like, cool. And we cast them up in resin, didn't we? And sold yeah. them. Yeah, you, should, you could have got sculpted credit on that. Um, no, I didn't. And then, um, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I think it was about. It was, I think the sales were dropping off, and also when we started doing texture paint, the sales of those really dropped. Because yeah. people just weren't flocking anymore and they weren't sanding, they were just putting paint on. And, and we just wanted to, we, Games Workshop, wanted, just wanted more unique products. And we'd also started selling bases at already built plastic yeah, textured yeah. bases. Like the Shattered Dominion Sh ones, yeah, yeah, and there was, a, there was a plan to do more of those, which I think fell, yeah. just, just on purely resource. So more actual, you could go and buy a set of more actual bases with more cool texture on. Mm. So then why start sticking stuff on when... Yeah. You, you can just buy a base and put bits on it. Yeah. So I think that's that's the reason why the Games Workshop wanted a more unique offer. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so this question is uh, from Lewis, and he's definitely uh, watched the previous chat because he refers to the hobby trumpet. Wow. <laughs> um, so TM. Yeah. Yeah. Toot toot. Uh, howdy. So I've noticed recently that many of the easy build models that didn't require glue. So that's push fit, right? Mm. Yeah. 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 That didn't require glue seem to have disappeared from sale outside of perhaps the bigger starter sets. This seems weird to me, given the hobby trumpet 
and lots of the purchases being made by parents. Any thoughts as to why this might be? Mm. It might just be retiring. Yeah. And the, some of the older models are just moving yeah, on. I mean, <laughs> I'm just looking back before I went, there was the Redemptor Dreadnought, which was push fit, and then they did the multi-part. But I thought they'd keep the, the, the easy to build version because they had the ATV as well, which was easy to build. Um, a lot of the Stormcast ones are still there. So you know the Dominion sets, yeah, um, they're all yeah. that. So like, um, uh, which I've, uh, this is surreal, by the way. Anyone that's watching this, go out and buy this set, right? So for Chris, uh, it was a birthday. Liz said to me, my friend's son is at Scouts. They're doing like the, the Scout Build badge for Games Workshop. And um, he was building some Cruel Boys. And he was like, can you get some more orcs? Because he likes these orcs. And I looked at the picture. I was like, oh, they're cruel boys. I'm going to have a look. So I went to workshop. It was like £37.50 for a box of 10 push fit cruel boys. Or, this is £37.50, I could spend £25 for the same set plus a commander and then a load of Stormcast and the rules to play the game because it's the, the starter edition. Well, this has happened. Yeah. Has this happened <laughs> with, um, I don't has, understand. Has this happened with Leviathan? Yeah, I think mm. so. Isn't, yeah. It, isn't it cheaper to buy... <laughs> Isn't it cheaper to buy one of the starter sets, yes. which then gives you loads of blum and tyranids, than it is to buy the star collecting all the combat yeah. patrol box for space marines? Yeah. I don't it's understand like, the maths. Yeah, but the, I'm the, happy for the maths to continue. Please, well, that's yeah. probably that's, that's probably the answer to the question: is that those models then mm. are now put into starter sets and yeah. divided out into battle forces, and then once the if there's a need for a multi part set. So that's like your, your very broad end, yeah, your very mean, broad yeah. end start sets. And as you move down, those users want something with a bit more flexibility or some more options, which by its very nature can't be a push fit or an easy to build. Yeah. It has to be a multi-part. Mm. That's probably, as you move further down your journey, those through down the hobby trumpet, yeah, so toot toot. Those cruel boys will become like a multi-part yeah. as opposed yeah. to... Yeah, further yeah, down yeah. the line, like, they'll become a multi-part. Well, you bear in mind that, you know, think how long ago it was they came out and we've still got, we've still got the easy build bikes for Marines. The Outrider bikes yeah. are still the easy build yeah. ones. Of course, it's not yeah. easy to build. Oh, is there no multi-part of those? No, they reckon mm. the 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 current rumor around the campfire is that they might get multi-parts when they do ones for Ravenwing. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and also it's expensive. These molds are expensive. Yeah, and you've got to try and get your money's and worth. Get, hard, man. It's partly why. That's also why you can get. I mean, the discount is there to get people in, but yeah. also it's on. It's also on quantity because if you make a ton of something, you pay off the mould cost. The, you, you, it's called amortisation. You, you have an upfront cost, which is your fixed cost, which is effectively your design costs and your manufacturing costs of the mould. That's a hundred million quid, whatever, call it a million quid. If you, make, if you only make 10,000 of that item, you have to put a proportion of that million quid into each box. So each box is then proportionally more expensive. Mm. If you make a million of them, you only have to put one pound of those into each box there, and that's kind of the way it works. Mm. Um, so that so you can reduce the cost of an item by literally just making more and amortising that mould across. So I think that's probably what's happened. Yeah. And also, as you go further down that trumpet or funnel or bath or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> um, things get more complicated, and that's the, probably the way it should be. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Um, I've been as as we've been chatting, I've been scrolling through, and there's quite a few questions related to fine cast and cheese. Um, <laughs> is it the same quality? <laughs> and, and I think, cheese is easier to mould. Yeah, well, I think <laughs> I'm going to try and condense all of those into yeah. one question. Okay. And it would be, if you had to replace fine cast with a cheese, <laughs> what cheese would that be? Probably have to be a really mature, like Gruyere or something, because they're quite hard, but still carvable. Well, they're crumbly, though? Would they no, be it's quite crumbly? waxy cheese, isn't okay. it? Yeah. Oh, so yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And you could probably do a little bit of sculpting as well, because you, you, you have to re-sculpt fine cast. Yeah. You could probably yes. Sculpt yeah, a bit yeah, of mature yeah, gruyere, yeah. Or, yeah. like some edam or something. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. All the, all the tough. Also, have, if you, also if you has bought, random holes in it as well. Yeah. If you yeah. had, um, <laughs> if you bought, <laughs> if you bought edam to make your miniatures, you could go to head start on doing your impurity seals for marines. Mm. And you could yeah. also like, you could play like, if <laughs> I kill it, I get to eat there, it yeah. as well. Yeah. Oh, that would be oh, fun. Do you need like? Yeah. Um, like cheese juice, if you get like. I don't know about your cheese juice, mate. <laughs> your I forgot squirt cheese, squirt cheese, a little squirt cheese for <laughs> the holes better. that we need, damn. Because oh, obviously, you get those yes, holes. Yes, of course. Yeah. Through the spray gun. Spray gun. Yeah, there you go. I meant to bring the spray gun in today. So oh, you did you get one? I did, I did get one. Yeah, I got hold of one. Yeah. One of our lovely patrons sent me one. Have yeah. you got the. I, I have some very, very kind customers who are, must at some point down sit down on the show and name. Uh, uh, have given me everything that I was when you went. I I made oh, this. Yes, yeah. I went. Ooh, everything I ooed and are at. Someone has very it's kindly very done. Dice. I've done very I very got the well. Dice as well. Did oh. you get the only thing that somebody I didn't know existed and now was seen 
Was you responsible for the the metal, um, the the thing that was a carry case, but was actually a metal uh, Imperial Guard box? The ammo case. Yeah. Yeah. Were yeah. you responsible for that? Probably. Yeah. I'm, 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 was that in like a green box? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I'm looking. I'm looking at one of them at the moment. Yeah, because that's when uh, I think they did the mags. The last yeah. gun mags at the same time. I think it was Apocalypse. I think it was for Apocalypse. Yeah, I've got last gun. You had the rucksacks as well that went with that. Imperial Guardsman's rucksack. Yeah, signal. Oh god, yeah. Because you could have like the Velcro straps that would be Caden or Volscarni cataphracts, which was cool. So you could be Chaos or Goodies, but it's the same backpack. They were designed around um, Napoleonic satchels. <laughs> They're really funny because it was like, it's, you know, your old. I never made that connection. Your old trotter's backpack. Yeah, yeah it's the same proportions as a trotter's yeah. backpack. Um, I like. It's really funny because someone copied them. We're like, yeah, where it's not really a particularly great rucksack. Yeah, it's very thematic, but it's not. Um, yeah, I, no, I, I could wrap it forever. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's it's always uh, it's always fun. Everything comes out. Uh, so we have a question from Matt uh, from Matt, um, which it starts off with a little bit of a story. Uh, for all its flaws, I found when Finecast worked, it really worked. The Lord Commissar particularly smashed. Uh, oh, I remember good. putting an Orion in the kettle and boiling it to <laughs> repose the miniature. It worked great. <laughs> Were there any other accidental side effects or benefits of the material that you found? <laughs> I don't really know. It probably saved a load of weight. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, you know, whether that impacted things or not, I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. But um, I no. mean, I didn't have that many in my army, so from no. a weight point of view, it wasn't that negligible. Oh, but the heat thing's great. Hair dryers are good for it as well, but yeah. it's resin. That's resin, so yeah. that's standard, isn't it? Stick your arm in a... Yeah, just boiled a cup of water and yeah. bend it back to shape. But. Yeah, yeah. But um, I think it had a memory though, because like I kept talking about Krell's axe. You probably will do. It kept going back to its you original little banana shape. That's the way the kind of grain, probably the wrong word for resin, but probably you know, yeah, the grain and the resin goes that way. Let's go with grain because we, we understand yeah. that. I understand that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. A few sassy comments about <laughs> fine cast. Was a soda stream involved somewhere in the process? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, the bubble's very clever. Yeah, okay. It's it wasn't, it wasn't wrong. No, yeah. because it wasn't vac chambered. Yeah. Ultimately, yeah. You had to spin all the bubbles out. Which yeah. Did or did not work, depending yeah. on your opinion. Yeah. I think it got better, didn't it? I can't remember. It was great for Nurgle skin. It looked really popped. Yeah, Nurgle army, <laughs> fantastic. Oh, great. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Uh, Anything else? Not so good. And then same commenter. Whose ground? Whose groundbreaking idea was it to use a material that melts in direct sunlight? Um, oh yeah, I remember that. Um, and all that sort of stuff. Um, quite yet. Yeah. Quite a few, uh, this, that, and the other. Uh, Liam asked, do you still design hobby tools? Uh, What hobby tool do you wish you had helped design or would like to release? Also, I loved your very clear explanation of why GW would not release a wet palette in your last appearance. Mm. I wouldn't say they probably, they might do at some point if they think it's right, but... Yeah. um, It's, do I still design? No, I don't design hobby stuff anymore. Um, I do a variety, I'm quite lucky, I've got like four different little jobs that I do that add up to a vague income. But, <laughs> but um, I was quite burned out when I left. I was mm. like, didn't, didn't want to touch anything to do with the toy. I've only just started painting again six, yeah. seven years later. Um, hobby tools wise. Understandable. Don't really know. I think it's difficult to know without really get, getting it. We totally touched on it last time about the hairdryer. That was just kind of a bit of a, or the paint dryer as, yeah. a bit, as a bit of fun. That was quite, quite good. Um, I would have probably would have liked to have another go at clippers. I don't think we ever got that quite right. Oh, he wants to say it. Go on, say it. I used some god hand clippers recently. Good? Oh my god! Yeah. Yeah. Um, the word you used was divine. Yeah, which makes sense. Yeah, it, they're like. But the noises you make and the words you should use was orgasmic. <laughs> <laughs> I just I can't put into words how. Um, different it felt to use them like clipping through a miniature it was like i was like i know what clipping stuff feels like no i don't like this is it like i guess like from from riding a bike and you go yeah you put both feet on and you pedal and it's got gears and stuff and then you have like a i don't know a really really fancy road bike with electronic gears and it all ticks really nicely and yeah, like it's a like a different experience precision like but then the price i'm like "Mm." (laughs) yeah Yeah. um i i think what do i think i think having different not defended the paint bottle but explained it last time i think yeah if i was to do i would like to have a look at the paint bottle again yeah if i was suddenly given a 
consultancy fee by GW. I think that's probably it's. I think we did it in two thousand and five, mm. so it's eighteen years old, and it, and the world is. <laughs> Wow. The world has moved on a long way. Yeah. When we did it... It's it was, old enough to drink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, we, when we did it, it had a very different... The demands on that project from senior management were very different. There was only one company doing dropper bottles. I always put this into uh, Google. They were the only people that were doing it. And now... So people... And I get, I get why people now make comparisons now, because... That's where you are. Yeah, but it was done in two thousand and five. Yeah, it was done to time. fit existing retail racking. That's why it's the dimension that it is, yeah. and that's why it kind of vaguely stacks. It was done to fit into existing cartons for transport. There was loads of constraints on that, mm. and we talked about this a lot the last mm. this episode. Yeah, yeah. The last one about constraints from a bigger business. There were a lot of constraints on it. It would be nice to do an almost um, non-constraint project. Mm. That's probably what would be my answer. I'd like to do yeah. a non-constrained project on what does the ideal hobby water. Uh, because they've all got problems. I've got. I've went out and bought a load, and there's none of them I'm actually very happy with. I've used three different versions of dropper pots, different pots, and none mm. of them are perfect. It yeah. may be that there's just not a perfect answer. Yeah, and you have to go with what, what's the best compromise. That's, but, I yeah. suppose that's your skill set, isn't it? It's like a designer, engineer kind of thing. It's like you go through that problem solving sort of like mindset. They're like, you know, these these are all good to a certain degree, but not perfect. How do I make the perfect? Well, you can't get perfect. Per- perfect. Well, not with that attitude, you can't well, tell. <laughs> perfection's the opposite of getting things finished. If you strive for perfection all the time, you won't ever get anything done. Yeah, and anyone, yeah. anyone that's been vaguely creative that, will know yeah. this. Yeah. So, yeah. Someone will say that about the artists, because like, sometimes you have to take the yeah, actual camera. Yeah, you take it off of... I just need to... No, <laughs> no, 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 it's done, it's yeah. done. You, yeah. You've even signed it. It's stopped painting We're coming it. in 20 minutes to take it off you. That's how long yeah. you've got. You know. I think there was, there was a YouTuber I watched uh, a few years ago cameras and all that sort of stuff I think Peter McKinnon was his name and uh, he's yeah he said done is better than perfect there yeah. Go. yeah there we go absolutely that's, that's absolutely it because it's like if I'm editing a video and I'm like oh I could you get to a point of like diminishing returns I'm yeah. like oh I could absolutely sync all this up with the music and uh, put these graphics on and make that transition a bit nicer but like it, and also how much you're paying yourself at that point so yeah. if you're being contracted yeah, yeah. like you know You've been given a, you've, you've taken a job on for a certain amount of money. At which point does your hourly rate get really stupid? Yeah, because you're still messing around with it. Mm. Yeah, and suddenly you've been paid two pound an hour at this point. Mm. Yeah, you need to at some point. Yeah, get it out the door. Yeah, exactly. so yeah, I think I think yes. Anyway, long winded way of answering that question. Yeah, no, that was very very good. Um, okay, so I put a doorbell outside and I keep getting notifications and it's like someone's at your door. Oh, is God. it the wind? Because that is picking up. Uh, yeah. Storm Debbie. Yeah. yeah. Oh, is, is, that it, is it Debbie? Today? There we go. Debbie. You just totally like time stamped this video. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, dear me. Uh, right. Uh, do you know how many units a model has to move to be available in plastic over fine cast? To my uninformed mind, it seems the 30k Primarchs would have sold better as plastic, but they're not. They're not fine cast, are no, they? No, they're just resin. Um, forge resin. Yeah. Was um, that more of a forge world decision to keep them resin? It would. Well, they're forge world. They're forge world miniatures, aren't they? Forge world miniatures, but they yeah. forge world. They don't do. But the business has made heresy models in plastic. Yes. So I don't know what the number is, but I suspect the number is a lot bigger than people think I it is. I suspect if you're looking at like Age of Darkness, is it called the box set for yeah. Age, yeah. Darkness, Age yeah. of Darkness? Yeah. yeah. As popular yeah. as that's getting, there's lots of plastified stuff of that. I, I wouldn't be surprised they end up doing like clam pack or you know like the hero yeah. scale or slightly hit bigger than hero scale. So if you take um, Gulliman, he's pretty big. He came in this, you know, uh, you can buy him on his own. But at the time they came in the set with some other characters, um, I imagine looking at the scale and they're slightly smaller than Gulliman because he's pretty chunky. Um, but I don't get. I, I think give it time because most of Specialist Game Studio are all doing stuff in plastic. I mean, they've made like the Arachna rig for um, yeah. Vansar. That and that's a kit, you know, plastic kit, and looks great. And you get two in there. So if they can do that, they'll it find might the time be, to do the characters. They might be trying some molding stuff there. Mm. Like, I wonder if they're using three D centered molds or something just to bring the cost. I don't know. Could be making stuff up. Mm. But I think it's 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 a big it's a big business. It, the number I don't know. It would be tens of thousands in yeah. reality, you know, yeah. which is a big, bigger number. Games Workshop tend to Games Workshop are a bit weird. They you tend to use manufacturing techniques, which you normally use for large production on medium production stuff. So you might use something that's for a hundred thousand, but they use it on ten thousand. But then mm. the customer is going to pay a lot of money for that yes. mm. because really that technology 
is suited for much higher production runs, but they feel that they can get better quality out of the 10,000 run. But then you need to amortise that tool across a smaller. Mm. So sometimes sometimes things have costed because they're cool, I reckon. Sometimes things cost a lot because they just know they're not going to make many of them. And you, that, tool ha- tool, uh, that tool has to be paid for, as does the designer. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. Interesting. Uh, well, fascinating. That's my catchphrase, isn't it? Fascinating. Um, a T-shirt with that on, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sean asks, uh, uh, another podcast um, uh, that I think me and Jeff guested on called the Brush Lickers, Brush Lickers Club. Shout out to those guys. Good guys. Uh, one good, good from guys. the Brush Lickers Club. How many sausages make a sausage dinner? Oh, Ooh. this is one of their podcast questions, <laughs> isn't it? I think minimum three. Yeah. Oh, always an odd number because... Even, yeah, num- even, even numbers aren't yeah. aesthetically pleasing. No. And you always want, it's like, I always go, if I'm going for a pint, my partner for one knows that it's not a pint, it's at least three pints. So if I'm going, so I'm, if I, if I'm going for a sausage dinner, at least three. Yeah. And I could quite happily eat significantly more. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Well, then five then is the obvious so probably five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it depends on the size of the sausage. Well, a lot, lot of things depend on the size of your sausage, but yes. <laughs> I mean, I find uh, bangers and mash, three sausages feels a bit pathetic. Five mm. sausages feel better. So oh, I think okay. five is, yeah. seems like the right answer. That's interesting. Sticking out yeah. of your mash, it just well, four doesn't look right, is, five looks great. Is bangers and mash a sausage dinner? Is it bangers and mash? Is that like a different thing? Maybe. I don't it's know. It's very philosophical, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean, what counts as a sausage dinner? Just sausage. Well, that, well, yeah. I mean, if it was just sausage, <laughs> just sausage. and you had one, then you could be like, okay, it's a hot dog. It's a hot dog. A sausage dinner. <laughs> I don't know. I'd, I'd say so because it's yeah. predominantly about sausage. I mean, the carbs are there just to you know add a bit sausage of sausage vehicle, right? aren't they? So you yeah. can hold it. Sausage yeah. vehicle. Yeah, <laughs> they, so, so they're like bangers and mash. The mash is is just a vessel to hold the sausage. To hold the sausage. Like, Take the whole, isn't it? Take yeah. the whole, similar. Yeah. Smoke. Yeah. But yeah. then sometimes the toe to hole ratio isn't really on. No, no. On. Then it's then it's that is like you've got a Yorkshire pudding dinner yeah. really with sausages in there somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. Maybe yeah. one. You're the going, only thing I would say You're going on a sausage adventure at the that The only point. thing I would say is that one sausage is the first answer. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh Okay. Um. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. You're um, welcome. <laughs> a question for all of you. Uh, if you could make the decision to have a new DW model, model made, what would be it slash they be? If it Ooh. were me, I would choose Exodites because mm. space elves on dinosaurs would mm. be awesome. It's pretty good. Good shout. Similarly, I would do Eldar Fire Dragons at the moment because I want some Fire Dragons mm. and they're in fine cost, yeah. stroke resin, and I ain't buying them. They're probably only another 15 away, years away from getting done, so I wouldn't worry. That's right, there'd be another 12 <laughs> Marine lieutenants before they release. <laughs> yeah. Not yeah. bitter. Not I, bitter. I, I was I was just going to go with the um, with the meme answer and be like, Primaris lieutenants. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh. I'd say Plastic Mordians. Yeah. Bit fun. Want to see some more guard regiments. Needs yeah. more guard regiments. Yeah. And, and, and it's funny because I'm not a guard player, but I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to back Mr. Peach. I think it's disgusting that there's not enough flavours of guard. No, we've yeah. been looking with Kill Team. Yeah. Just, uh, I think that's helped a bit, but, uh, you know, even then... Fingers crossed that still, even though it's oil rig Kill Team, fingers crossed that it's, yeah. that catcher chan still get uh, a, a ten-man squad. Yeah. yeah. Like they did with Death Corps Creek. That, yeah. You know. I'd yeah. like to see, that's what I'd like, that's my answer, decent-looking catch chans. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're quite old now, aren't they? Christ, yes. yeah, not all. The, the, the jungle fighters set themselves are like 96, yeah. Yeah, I think. Yeah, it's ridiculous. The big burly ones. Yeah, and then the command and the heavy weapon squads were done by the Perrys when I was in the studio set up, probably like 2009, 2010. Yeah. And they're much better. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they're scaled better. Yeah, and, they, they and look, the heavy weapons teams, they, yeah, they the don't look right, though, next to the, yeah. the, 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 the main core set. Apparently, the Kachchan uh, infantry squad is in, a, in an ever eternal battle with the fire dragons. <laughs> <laughs> and then one of the other ones. That might be the next got, kill team. Yeah, yeah. What, 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 <laughs> the other, what are the other ones? Are the void spiders or something? Are they? Oh, warp spiders. Warp spiders. Warp spiders. See, I like warp spiders, but because they weren't in the original white dwarf, I'm a bit like they don't really exist in my head. Because uh, like, uh, they were like a second. They were 40k second edition. So for me, I'd still go back to that. The, oh, yeah. There is, you yeah. know. Original one, like, yeah. and fire dragons or sweeping hawks would be me. Yeah, the, yeah, they're kind of a weird 
I've only just recently looked them because uh, Andrew Gibson showed me some stuff on his um, feedback tier um, and he was doing some warp spiders asking for suggestions and stuff and I was like oh they are quite chunky and dated aren't they but he's done a great job painting them he's done yeah. a little spider design on the back of the armour as well it looks very nice but he's putting a lot of effort into that Eldar armour it's great I really like it um, yeah it's, de it's definitely because um, it was him that's using this we got the splatter tool to do the star effect on his yeah, yeah. Um, grav tanks and stuff no it's good they're old models as well. The graph tanks, yeah. Yeah. A lot of dated stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, someone asks, uh, what is your favourite niche GW product? Me? Oh, mm. server skull tape measure, obviously, but I mean. Yeah. Yes. Um, in the current range, I don't know. I'm, I'm, not ve I'm not very familiar with the current stuff. I mainly just do the stuff I like, which is dead Eldar people. Yeah. 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 Um, Dead Eldar. Dead Eldar. Um, like Best kind of Eldar. Doing, I, doing I and an army. That's, that's kind of where I stick. <laughs> Which is why I don't have a uh, niche. I don't really know. Um, all the stuff I've done, probably the service call tape measure. Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty random. And I'm... Level of, le levels of madness that we needed to create it's just it. Cool. It's just Yeah. It's just fun. It's just fun. Yeah. I like stuff like that. It's a bit irrelevant. Irre uh, I can't even use the Do you know word. Like irreverent. Yeah. Irreverent. irreverent. Yeah. yeah, I like stuff like that. Because it has a humour to it. And yeah. it offsets a lot of some of the... Yeah. The Grim Darking, which is... Because so since I've got mine, I now refuse to use any other tape measure <laughs> when I'm wargaming. The thing is, you can kill a man with that tape measure as well. I will, you know, if I can't, I, I won't go, oh, well, I'll just use one of these. Yeah. I will search for that to take that yeah. to go game. Yeah. I'm not, I, I've got I the, um, I quite like it, although I disappeared for a time, I managed to get it back, was the um, Aegis Sigma um, tape measure. It's just... Uh, it's really like the metal the medallion. Yeah, the medallion. You can definitely yeah, kill yeah, a man with that yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> it was so heavy. But I just like using it because it just feels like chunky. But then Liz comes along with a massive, great big tape measure that's like 20 metres long going, that's not a tape measure, this is a tape measure. I'm like, all right, darling. Yeah, you go, right. it's all right. I don't own any basilisks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I know. I just, can I change my mind? Yeah. <laughs> I like the powder monkey... Oh, from yeah. the Empire State Troops sprue. Yeah. And Powder Monkey got a life all of his own. It was, was a handgun sprue, wasn't it? Yeah, it was in, never yeah. really intended to be anything. Yeah. And suddenly he, the, the little thing suddenly got a massive following. Yeah. And it was just meant to be a little throwaway part. I'm not even sure it was even meant to be on the sprue, but it ended up on the sprue. And everyone wasn't just, it like someone got confused because when someone said Powder Monkey, because obviously you get little kids on ships. Yes, that like, make a Powder Monkey. Yeah, someone yeah. actually literally took it at face value when they made a monkey with like an Empire hat on it. Absolutely amazing. Um, but, it's great, yeah. But then Canadian Games Day, they made a T-shirt. One of their designers was make, used to make really good T-shirts and we used to get them over because I was in sales support. And one of them had a Powder Monkey on it. And then we start, and then there was a vote for, an internal vote for like, it must have been Warhammer 30. Like mm. what's the best, they're trying to find what was the studio's top 10 miniatures ever. And then we engineered, we did engineer a vote, a mass vote for the Empire Powder Monkey, yeah. which was... Makes we, sense. We got in trouble for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but. <laughs> it's like when, uh, oh, um, was it Christmas number one ages ago, there was people Rage going, oh, yeah, yeah, we're so sick of the X Factor getting Christmas number one. And then it was the whole, F you, I won't do what you tell me. <laughs> yeah, it, was, yeah. it was the same studio. That was really funny. Yeah. The same studio that was... The yeah. one they were voting against was yeah. actually was actually responsible for the song that voted against oh, no, 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 no. it. This, yeah. this counterculture move was like, you're not benefiting anyone. Yeah. <laughs> There's no ethical means of consumption under capitalism. Yes. Yep. Go. <laughs> Empire Powder Monkey. Love that model. <laughs> I like Do you remember the crab took on our whole life of its own, didn't it, a couple yeah. of years yeah. ago? Yeah. Games yeah. I reckon that squid's now going to be the next one because they've uh, cause the Eth did... Uh, as it got dubbed Crabnos instead of Cragnus. Um, and then they've done a new IDNF set now and they've got like a little floating squid guy, um, which looks great. I reckon you could take that head and put it on like a large scale model to have like a That'd Cthulhu cool. sort of thing. To uh, me that says there's something, there's some something missing. There's a bit of humour missing yeah. sometimes well, you, that people actually, yeah. that helps people engage That's a bit more good. or yeah. shows, the, shows the sense of humour within the company. I'm, I'm, I started playing in Rogue Trader. I've got, um, you know, back when it was full of 80s pop culture and political references. Yeah. Well, do you remember the um, the, the, the Photoshop thing for a while, wasn't it? It was that crab <laughs> with that grot machine gunner that lives on the top of that oh, orc. Oh, yeah. Stood on, top of the, stood on top of the crab was the thing, wasn't it? And I thought oh, that was amazing. so good. Oh, that's genius. <laughs> um, brilliant. Uh, based on your experience, would there be enough demand for GW cons to consider larger scale display models such as busts? 
I guess they're doing that. Well, they're on the West. Yeah. They're doing it. So West yeah. is coming in. I think, think. I think it's not their core business. Get someone yeah. that knows what they're doing yeah. to do it. And yeah. if they establish a big enough market, then maybe they might move into that. That's what lies. I mean, but there's that guy there. Yeah. I mean, you know. It's a big old model. Yeah. Um, I think long 10, 15 years maybe. But, you know, there's the, what, the Joy Toy stuff. Mm. Yeah. Um, they're all, they're, I think you need to, as long as it fits your core IP and looks good enough, the quality's there. I'm back again. But I think, I think they need to stick to yeah. making cool toy soldiers. Yeah as the core business don't get confused don't really focus on that it's very easy to get really confused like Inquisitor when it all got really confusing with 54 mil because that was another project that that was kind of that there was a project going on which was 54 mil this is my understanding anyway could be wrong don't quote me Um, there was a project which was larger scale display miniatures Mm. and then there's a project going on which was this role play game Mm. and then someone went and it probably wasn't the best idea. Yeah. Because, yeah. You know, uh, I mean, I like the fact there's a move now for Inquisitor 28, so, yeah. they call it, which is just yeah. you know, the same rule set. You just use 28, 20 mil, 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 normal yeah. scale. I mean, I say 28, but they're like 32, aren't they? Yeah. Something like that. So. But, I think yeah. it would just be very, it's very easy to get confused. And every time Games Workshop gets confused, something wrong tends to happen <laughs> or mm. something gets forgotten. Mm. So I think the problem might be a market, but I think you're better off having someone else do it. Yeah. 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 Cool. That makes sense. Lovely. And then, uh, as I think, uh, Two of my cameras have overheated as I just edit between black screens. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, the we, yeah, I'm getting getting towards the end of the questions. Lots of them we've covered in the chat anyway. So uh, lots some of the ones about fine cast and stuff like that. Uh, so so we'll end on uh, on uh, Gareth's critical question. Ooh. Ooh. Oh. We, should we have this as a thing every week, Gareth's critical, critical question. question. Yes. Yeah, so, fully figure out Gareth and get right in all the time. Yeah, yeah. welcome to the Patreon, Gareth. Um, Tom, I'll put my Hi, uh, Gareth voice. <laughs> critical question, Tom, if you had to replace each of your limbs with popular UK biscuits, <laughs> <laughs> what biscuit would they be? And you can, he's given options. You oh. can, so... Your arms and hands can be one biscuit. Yeah. Your legs and feet can be another, and then a separate one for your head. Cool. <coughs> I think you need like, arms. You need a bit of length and stability, don't you? Mm. So really, probably a chocolate bourbon. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. was thinking bourbon, yeah. yeah. And you could, like, somehow fit two together so you could have elbows. Could articulate a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, I see the, the one that's a, a, a blind or obvious is that is, cho- is Cadbury's chocolate fingers, isn't it? Oh, but it melts. Oh, yeah. true. Um, but most but the chocolate melts, not the actual uh, bit in the biscuit. middle. Mm. Yeah. yeah, this is very considered. I like those. You know, I've got a bit of a soft spot for those pink wafers. Yeah, so I might, I might have those for my legs. So fragile, though. And <laughs> so fragile. Though. <laughs> I mean, if, if you, would, you wouldn't be able to go out running in the rain. <laughs> 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 Just getting sore through as you ran. <laughs> Oh, yeah. well, so you just have to pick up and you stall do, so in yeah. the middle of the road. You're not doing your triathlons with pink wafer legs. <laughs> <You're not even laughs> you're really not. And then, uh, skip leg one. <laughs> our head has to be a dark chocolate um, hobnob because it's the king of biscuits. So, you know, yeah. why would I not want the king of biscuits for my head? Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, why not? Arms then. What, 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 what? Oh, chocolate bourbons, I think. Oh, chocolate, chocolate bourbons for arms and legs as pink wafers. Yeah, just because I like pink <laughs> wafers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just because I like them. Yeah. <laughs> Next time you're on, I'm going to make you a little biscuit cake. Top. <laughs> <laughs> biscuit top. Genius. Oh. Amazing. Uh, those are all the all the uh, Patreon questions. Um, yeah. Have you got anything burning you want to... I think we've Should covered, we think we've covered everything. Up? Yeah, good. Yeah. Um, as before, yeah, it's just... just wanted to explain a bit more about how things happen. Mm. And, and, there's, and there's, I think the key message for me this time around is... And you've talked about it a lot. There's a lot of very good people that work there mm. and they're doing things the best they can to the best of their abilities to give and brief. Yeah. And it's very, I think anyone that singles out individuals don't, don't do that because they're working for a company. And yeah. generally most decisions at Games Workshop are done for the right reasons. Maybe the right reason for shareholders, but they're done for the right reasons. They're not out there to, very rarely out there to screw people. I don't think they've ever gone out deliberately to screw people over. It's just not, no. whether you agree with the decision or not, doesn't mean that the corporate culture yeah, it's interesting you see those kind of like comments from time to time going, you know, they're at it again, they're trying to like ruin our hobby. And we're like, I don't think, because if they ruin your hobby, then there's no one to buy their stuff. And Yeah, it's just, it's just 
shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it makes yeah, no sense so as, a, as a business. Your alone, hobby may be so far down the end of that hobby trumpet that you've lost perspective on yeah. on everything else. And there's something wrong with being fu- this. That's perfectly valid. This, this person here, this niche, this niche end is just as valid as this person yeah. here. It's yeah. just, just there's just less of you. Yeah, which is which is the thing. So. Yeah. That, Decisions are going to be more likely made towards this end than this end. Yeah. And ultimately, Games Workshop needs to make money. It's a pub- get publicly traded company. Yeah. But I'll say with shareholders, that and its, its decisions will pri- the primary reason for its decisions will be to. And I've seen this a few times recently because more and more people from the olden days are starting to appear on podcasts like this yeah. and talk. The primary re- the primary driver is shareholder value. How do we get the share price up mm. fundamentally? Because that's what and how do we pay a dividend? Because that's mm. what the owners of the company want. Yeah. And if that annoys a few people, but pleases a larger number of people, then you've increased your shareholder value. Yeah. And if you see if you see it through those eyes, you can understand a lot more about how the business. The other yeah. thing I would say to people before I go is, if every year Games Workshop does on their invest- investor relations website publishes the annual report. Yeah. And in there, they'll pretty much it's pretty dry, and it's quite long. But in there, they will lay out all of their current decision making and strategic decision making. Oh, and everything else. Mm. If you want to know how, what, what Games Workshop does and why it does what it does, every year they write it down yep. and you can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not a secret. S- it's not a secret. So few people read that document and they'll lay down what they're doing. They'll talk about the increase of plastification or I'm sure if you go back far enough, they'll talk about the launch of Finecast. Mm. Now, they might cover it in business words, which aren't entirely transparent, yeah. Yeah. but it will... The decision-making process will be there. And they may yeah. say, we've had some troubling times or something. Yeah. If you want to know what Games Workshop is doing and what they plan to do, go and read that re- annual report because it's all in there. Yeah. And you'll, and you'll understand a lot more. It may make you really angry. It may not. I read it. I've, I've read those reports a couple of times and they are so dull. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> but, but there's not a lot of shooting and killing in it and I'm just not no. interested in that kind of like text. Yeah. <laughs> but it's there. You'll understand who the officers are, who the depart- what, yeah. the, who the, what the departments are, yeah. what's going on, what the vision is, what the budgets are. It's very dull. But there's a lot of talk, and yeah. spend 20 minutes or half an hour and go and read that, and you'll understand a lot more about the company. What yeah. unique peaches to the annual report to then be written by Dan Abbott? <laughs> oh, you can Wouldn't do a, that be amazing? You can do a peachy version. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And always, always someone in there dies as well. Yeah, really, yeah. It's like, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> They've taken yeah. Chaos Black out of the range. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can you imagine if they did that? Uh, Chaos Black spray gone for good. No, don't do that. I love, they that, just, I love that spray. They wouldn't do that. Surely. They'd never do it. I've said it now, so probably, yeah. No. Okay, a white, a black, and a grey. Always there. Yeah. Might change, sure. might change the name, though. No, oh, it might turn to yeah. a black and black. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. Korax weight is now White Scar, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So. True. Maybe Chaos Black might be Templar Black. You never know. Yeah. Black Legion, Black Templar, Corvus Black, and Abaddon Black are the, the blacks tones do in they the do Citadel a, do at the moment. Do a Chaos Black pot? Yes. Or is it just the it's, spray? It's a bad in black is the... Uh, no, so there isn't a direct right, yeah. equivalent. Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if they change it to a bad in black at some point yeah. because then, then you've got a colour match. Because yeah. yeah. at the moment that, that's a... That's but even a, then they don't fully colour match. No. You still have to thin it down and go all over. But yes, it's close, yeah. but not. Yeah. So there's no direct pot. Yeah. I, think they, yeah. I think we kept it because Everyone knows there would it. have been a riot. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Almost a bigger be. riot is when they nearly ran out of... Well, at one point, I remember the canteen restaurant... They ran out of coffee. One, the coffee mm. machines all broke. This is bad. And then they ran out of bacon. So one day in Lenton, no bacon, no coffee. I mean, I was all right because I was teeing sausages, so I was fine. No, but this was, <laughs> this yeah. was real five sausages. Is always the question. Five sausages. This was a bad day. <laughs> yeah, a lot of disciplinaries on that day. <laughs> it was the milk, though, once they had no milk. Because yeah. sometimes you have your fridges and you have like a central milk station where you can go and help yourself to. Uh, and all, and p- people were doing like Satan as air level commando raids on different departments to get their milk. Um, so I'd go to the fridge to make a cup of tea and there's no milk. So I'm like, upstairs, there's some milk you got there. Someone's already been there, stole that milk and taking it over to the other building. <laughs> so I was like trying to just track that. In the end, just people just went out to the Trent and Vineyard. bought milk. <laughs> yeah, just bought milk. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be like, in the time it took them to steal the milk. Like, yeah, I, I, I guess it's not fact, a spot. It was just like all these little sneaky raids just to go to other departments yeah. and get so their by milk. by the time you put the camouflage cream on and your woolly hat yeah. on, yeah. and Leppo crawled down the corridor to steal some milk, you could have been to Sainsbury's and back. Yeah, what? you distract the guards and I'll sneak past. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get past the admin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Tell them Finecast is amazing and they'll, <laughs> they'll yell at you for half an hour. <laughs> you, can, you can do anything you want behind the scenes or they're still shouting at you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dearie me. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Again. Yeah, absolute it's pleasure. Thanks for coming back. It's, it's been wonderful. Enjoyed it again. Yeah. And as always, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe because we had this guy on hit, hit the like loads and view it loads because this guy's full of info. So yes, thanks, thanks, Tom. And I'm not ready to wonder a... what we can get you back for another time. Well, I'm sure I'm we can. I'm sure we'll find subject. something. <laughs> There'll be one day Tom goes, "I've got real strong opinions about this project that's come out." <laughs> cool, <Yeah>. good. Come, <laughs> <on>. <laughs> come, and <tell laughs> come and tell the whole world all about them. It will be wet palettes and something else, like new, new paint pots, maybe. Oh, oh that's that's got at least two shows in it. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever done any web design? <laughs> <laughs> I've done a bit of web design. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Perfect. Yes. Amazing. Tulipips. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.